Advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Welcome to the show. It is Tuesday morning. It is August 21st. I don't know where the time is going. I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like I'm being flung down a wind tunnel. Uh, we're not doing the jargon of the day yet. It's not that wind tunnel. Uh, that's coming later. But we're going to be with you live for the next three hours talking about topics uh, that have to do with being the most efficient, most effective member you can be helping a child on the autism spectrum to reach their full potential. That's what we talk about here. We talk about what's possible. We give you ideas of things that you might be doing at home and hopefully try to uplift you a little bit with this idea that is uh it's not just an idea it's uh it's more than that it's a it's a movement um and it's hope that there is in fact progress to be had with each and every one of our children i know that to be true because i'm a parent i my son was diagnosed when he was two and a half he's now nine and my son was very profoundly affected by autism now i always like to remind everybody that I know and you know that all of our kids are different um, and their paths are different and how they respond to things and the the speed with which they learn it's different for all kids and uh, and I always want to remind you that I know that and that my child's path is not going to be the same as your child but I do like to remind everybody that my son was very profoundly affected by autism and my son you know we talk from time to time about recovery because recovery Recovery is real. There are a lot of kids who do recover. My son is not yet deemed recovered. He is in that middle group that has made a tremendous amount of progress and that he's looking forward to a really full and rich life where he is not held back by autism, but he still qualifies for a diagnosis of autism. So I like to throw that out there because I am wildly happy with our results. Are we still working? You betcha. Every day we continue to work on things and work through things. And oh, we'll talk later about what yesterday afternoon was like. Uh, oh, I have microphone issues. We can't have that. Um, but in any case, uh, I want to remind you that I, I do get it, that all of our kids are different. But I still hold fast to the idea that there is progress for each and every one of our children. And I don't know about you, but as a parent, I get really miffed. I think it's the thing that upsets me more than anything else right now when people say, well, you know, all of these kids don't make the penultimate progress. So do we really want to spend all the money and all the time that it's going to take to help all of them make progress? That makes me nuts because of course we do. Of course we do. And I think for any parent and any teacher who is about teaching all of their children, and I think that most teachers are, uh, the idea that we wouldn't spend the money and the time if it wasn't the ultimate result um, I, is shocking to me. All of our kids are worth it. All of our kids deserve to make progress. And we know that we can make progress if we're willing to spend the money. I'm sorry, there is that question there and we'll help you to figure that out, how to find the money. Um, but the time and the energy, our kids are worth it, all of them, all of them. And again, 
you know, if somebody is telling you that your child can't make progress, they are not the person to listen to. I'm just going to call them a liar. Liar, liar, liar. All of our kids can make progress. How do we do that? Through a series of different tools. We know, uh, and this is something we talk about a lot on the show, we know that ABA is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism and that it is successful at creating progress with all of our kids, wherever they are on the spectrum, whatever their age is. Yep. We talk about early intervention all the time and how effective early intervention is, and that's true. We want to get working with these tools as early as we possibly can. But there is no reason to think, there is no scientific evidence to think that if, a, if somebody is 17, that's it, ABA won't work. In fact, we know that there is actual evidence that ABA works for all of us at whatever age we are, not just on the autism spectrum. So we do talk about ABA a lot, but it's not the only thing we talk about. Um, <clears throat> but we will talk about tools having to do with ABA and how we can, we can learn to have these tools in our tool belt so we can apply them in creative ways. This is a creative art. This is what I'm coming to uh, with ABA. I'm, each year I understand a little bit more and I'm, I'm saying, you know, this is a lot like painting, knowing which tool to use when to get the result you want. Uh, it's really kind of exciting. Okay, so uh, how can you participate in this conversation? Because that's exactly what this show is meant to be, is a conversation where you tell us what you need and we try to provide you with resources to help you okay so there's lots of different ways that you can participate and I always like to remind everybody I am NOT an expert I'm not an expert in autism I'm not an expert in ABA I'm not an expert in you know a whole bunch of things I'm not an expert in but I want to be a conduit to you for you to those experts to help you to get the answers that you want so how can you write in and tell me what you need well <clears throat> We have, uh, if you're watching us on autism-live.com, you'll see that there is a box there that says, Shannon is answering. And uh, that box below it, when we're live, is active. I, I'm given to understand that sometimes when we're not live, it might also be active. So if, uh, if, you, are, if you type in a question and it comes in, it will show up on my screen. Uh, if you type it right now, it will show up on my screen right now. But we are somehow mysteriously getting messages uh, sometimes from the night and Somebody left a message last night, so we'll be answering that today and in the next couple of days. Um, but in any case, you can type in your question, hit enter, and it shows up magically here on my screen, and we can have a conversation in real time. When we have a guest or an expert uh, in here, you can be asking them the question. Really great. Uh, if you're watching and it says rebroadcast, then uh, there are lots of ways that you can still get a hold of us. And even if it's a guest or an expert, keep in mind that we have a way of getting in touch with them afterwards, and we let them know when they leave. You know, we might be sending some questions your way, and they're really excited about that, to answer questions. So feel free to ask even if it's after the fact. That's what we're here for. So how do you do that after the fact? Lots of different ways. Uh, one way is through email. You can send us an old-fashioned email, and isn't that funny that now we're saying that email is old-fashioned? So email us here at the studio, and Emily's going to start to put some of those uh, different things up on the screen. There it is. Uh, and email us here. We'll answer your question on the next available live show and we'll also send you a typewritten response sometimes a link to so that you can see exactly where in the show that does take a couple of days so keep that in mind be patient with us uh, but you can send us that email and we'll be happy to track down the answer for you you can also if you're into instant gratification call into the show uh, you can call us right now be patched into the studio and you and I can be having a conversation in real time you don't you don't find just talking as exciting? You want full picture of you on the screen here with me? Well, you can Skype in. If you've got a computer that has a camera, then we can uh, have that happen and you and I can be sitting here side by side having a conversation. If you have Skype and you're Skyping internationally but you don't have a camera on your computer, uh, you can still Skype in with us and we'll do the audio only. So take advantage of that. Skype is a wonderful thing. We enjoy using that. Uh, you can also talk to us on Facebook. We have our new Facebook page, Autism Live. We appreciate while you're there if you'll like us and share us and take a look at all the resources that are on that page. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that uh, some interviews that we've done and also some stories that I look and see on Facebook that I think might be of interest to you guys. So check us out on Facebook and you can also be tweeting with us. We really love it when you guys tweet. It is, I'm still 
building my Twitter chops and I'm not as, as proficient as I wish I was, but you know, give me opportunities and I will get better at it. Uh, so check us out on Twitter. Now I mentioned that you could be watching us on autism-live.com and there are lots of other ways to watch us as well. You could be watching us on blip.tv. If you've missed some shows in the past or there's a topic that you're particularly interested in, go ahead and write to us and say that we're interested in this topic. But from time to time, I'm going to say to you, hey, we did a show about this already. You can check it out on blip.tv or you can check it out on our YouTube channel. You can pause, rewind, look up those old shows. Uh, really easy, friendly. It's like having a DVR of all the shows we've ever done and all the interviews we've ever done. It's really kind of nice. No extra work for you. So check us out on blip.tv. You can also find us, as I mentioned, on our very own YouTube channel. Uh, it just keeps growing and growing. We've aired a lot of shows now at this point. Since we're here three hours a day, it amasses, right? And so we've got a lot of interesting topics there for you. Check them out. Some of them fun and fluffy and some of them very serious about some challenging behaviors. So check that out. And we're also available as a free download on iTunes. And I'm very proud to be able to say that it's all free. All of our support here for you is all free as it should be. And we are also available on Ustream. So check us out there as well. If there is a way that you would like to be watching us that is not on that list, would you please do me a favor and let us know because we want to be of service to you in the way that you need. And it may be that there's just another service that we just don't know about. So let us know. I don't know about it. Okay, uh, I mentioned earlier that at some point today we were going to do the jargon of the day. This is the time of day when we take on one word, one phrase, one anagram and see if we can make sense out of it in a way that is able to help us today with our children. Now yesterday the term that we talked about was extinction birth so and it occurred to me that we should really talk about what extinction is because uh, that needs to be uh, a little bit clearer. So that is our term today extinction. We try to make friends with these terms because it's going to help us with our children. Extinction is one of those really it's like mercury it's hard to get your fingers on um, and it takes a couple of times working on something with your child before I think you truly get it. Um, I've had this conversation. It took me a while. I'm just going to tell you flat out that it was a good six months to a year before I truly understood extinction. And <clears throat> my husband will tell you he still wrestles with it sometimes. And and sharing it with family members, uh, they, they would say, I don't quite get it. And I'll explain why. Okay, but what is extinction? Well, we know, we've heard of the word extinction, right? We know what happens when an animal goes extinct. We, that's the context in which we've heard it. So what does it mean in terms of autism? Okay, here's our actual definition. Procedure that reduces behaviors through the cessation of reinforcement previously used to maintain the behavior. Okay. If that seems a little bit too wordy for you, let's see if we've done any better on our working definition. No longer reward a behavior and it will go away. How simplistic is that? Okay, so we've talked a little bit in the past about the three-term contingent. This is one of the really basic things that we want to understand about ABA and about behavior. That Anytime we do any behavior, we, we call it the ABCs of behavior, right? Uh, so it helps us to remember that anytime there's a behavior, there's something that happens before. And in autism land, they refer to that as the antecedent, actually in psychology land. It's not just aut autism. So, okay, so there's a behavior, but before the behavior happens, there's an antecedent, something that happens that triggers the behavior. Then there's the behavior, and then there's the consequence. You're sitting there on your couch, and you start to feel uncomfortable and you look at your watch and you realize oh my gosh it's lunchtime and so you get up and you make a sandwich or whatever and you sit down and eat the sandwich and then you feel better right so what was the antecedent you started to feel uncomfortable you had this feeling of you know all is not right with the world and you checked your watch and realized okay it's okay for me to have lunch all right that's the antecedent you got uncomfortable and you checked to make sure yeah no that's what it is I'm hungry then you went to the refrigerator and you made a sandwich and you ate it that's the behavior right and then the consequence of the behavior was you felt better 
Bing, 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 A, B, C. Everything, stop and think about everything that you do on a regular basis. Everything that you do, period, has an A, a B, and a C. There's the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. When we, when we talk about um, changing behaviors, I know as parents and sometimes as teachers, we get hung up on the behavior. Well, they're doing this. Why are they doing that? I wish they wouldn't do that. That's really making me uncomfortable. I don't want them to do that behavior. It's messing me up, right? And we don't have a whole lot of control. A lot of times we think, well, you know, physically, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I've laughed before about how I want to duct tape my son to a wall. I, you know, I'm not going to do that. But what you really have very little control over actual behavior. And as kids get older and they get bigger, you have less and less control. When they're a baby, you know, you can, you can put them in the crib, right? Um, what are you going to do with a 15-year-old? You can't physically make them do something, right? But you do have control over antecedents and you do have control over consequences. And when we change antecedents and consequences, ah, lo and behold, behavior changes. And that's exciting. So uh, we're always looking for, though, what is the payoff for a behavior. We call it the function of the behavior because every behavior has some sort of payoff. Even if it seems like it's a really negative behavior and it's hurting the person, there's some sort of payoff. So uh, when we talk about extinction, we're really looking at consequences. What is the payoff for this behavior, the function of the behavior? And I really advise that we don't armchair quarterback this, that uh, unless you're an expert in behavior, it, especially if it's something that is a challenging behavior that we not try to take on finding the function of the behavior by ourselves. When we do, we run the risk of being wrong and creating circumstances in which our child could get hurt or hurt somebody else. That's not worth it, right? So it's really advisable to have a BCBA, board certified behavior analyst, or somebody who has extensive experience with behavior, a psychologist, someone like that, to come in and look at the behavior from a 360 degree perspective and find the function of the behavior. There are some times when we find the function of the behavior that we see, oh, okay, well, this behavior is actually being rewarded in a way that we don't want that to happen anymore. Sometimes we don't have control over it. Perfect example, if a child is acting out in the classroom and, uh, and it might be in a really negative way, the other kids in the classroom are laughing. And we discover that the function of the behavior, the thing that's maintaining it, the reason why it keeps happening over and over and over again, is because the child likes that attention. Now, I, you know, I've, I'm I'm ex-classroom teacher, and you know, to be able to tell 25 to 30 kids, okay, don't laugh when he does that. How successful are we going to be? Mm, not. Okay? But there are some times when a child does something that we have a lot of control over the consequence. That, you know, for those children who are throwing the tantrum in the grocery aisle because they want a piece of candy and grandma gets flustered and rather than having the child melt down in the grocery aisle, grandma says, here, have the candy. Okay, that's a clear one. And everybody goes, oh, well, who would ever do that? Come on. We've all, I've done that. Haven't you done that at, at times? It's not good. We don't want to do that. <laughs> but we do sometimes because we're human. Okay, so that's a perfect example of grandma has control over that consequence. You may not have control over grandma, but grandma has control of that consequence. When we put a behavior on extinction and we find out what the function of the behavior is, we're trying to cut off the paycheck. So if the child is having a tantrum in the grocery aisle because they want the candy and the, you know, the person who's doing the FBA, the functional behavior assessment says, okay, the function of this behavior was that they wanted access to a thing. They want the candy. And by throwing the tantrum long enough, grandma gave them the candy. That was the consequence. So our extinction procedure is that we are no longer going to give candy when the child throws a tantrum in the grocery aisle. That doesn't mean that we're never going to give candy. Au contraire. Uh, we're going to give candy when the child behaves appropriately because what the child wanted was the candy. So we're going to do a couple of things here. We're going to teach the child functional communication skills to appropriately ask for candy so that he doesn't need to tantrum anymore, right? 
and eventually over time we will make sure that he knows that you don't always get candy but in the beginning we're going to give him candy if he asks appropriately but we are never ever ever going to give candy for tantrum behavior again and that's a difficult time, right? Because what's going to happen when you, if the child, if this has been happening a lot, you go through the, the grocery aisle and the child says, candy, right? And you're, you're now going to put it on extinction, which means not only are you not going to give the candy, you are not going to give attention to the tantrum. Uh, so now your child's going to flip out you're still paying attention to the child, not the tantrum. And what's the difference? So if the child starts to kick, you're going to move the shopping cart in a way that the child can't kick anymore. Or they can kick, but they're not gonna kick you. It may mean that you're holding the cart like this, and then the child starts to peel your hands off the cart, right? I mean, we've all been there. Um, and you're not going to say, no, don't do that, but you're going to move your hands to a place where the child can't get it. And they're just going to get madder and madder, and the tantrum is going to happen, right? Um, but, you're going to finish your business if you can or leave the grocery store and go outside if you have to and usually when you put something on extinction it's good to have another person there so that you can carry out the extinction um you know i'm giving the example of at the grocery aisle but extinction can happen for lots of different things but if you have to you have to be prepared to leave the grocery store um, and to be able to handle a child who's tantruming in the parking lot of a grocery store but what we see is that when we put it on extinction you're cutting off the reward you're cutting off the paycheck and we talked about yesterday how sometimes the behavior is going to get much worse before it gets a lot better but that that's a short window of time called an extinction burst but when we do cut off the paycheck the behavior will stop or dramatically increase if you're not able to cut it off completely sometimes there's an element of extinction that you don't have control over right um, but it's, it's swift, it feels severe as a parent when you're doing it, and it's something you have to be mentally prepared for and take on. Um, but the reason why it's so difficult, I think, is that a lot of people mistake ignoring the behavior for ignoring the child. And there are some times when we, it's something called planned ignoring that we will use sometimes in an extinction uh, procedure. And you need to know what you're actually putting on extinction. A lot of times it's attention driven. It isn't always, right? But we want to be very mindful of the attention that we give when we're in an extin extinction procedure. So uh, my husband still to this day, he's like, I don't, sometimes I don't know what am I supposed to ignore and what am I supposed to react to? Um, and it all comes down to the function. If the function of the behavior is that they want something, we're stopping giving them the thing that they want. We're going to give minimal attention though to the negative behavior that comes with that. It's really something that uh, it's very confusing and if it's difficult for you to understand just keep asking the person who's working with you uh, with your child about specific circumstances so that you know exactly how to react in that specific circumstance there are times when you know you only want to do this when you have made a decision to put a behavior on extinction um, otherwise we're not ignoring Right? Uh, so it's not like we're just going to ignore all behavior that our child does or all challenging behavior, only the behavior that we have put on extinction. And by the way, you don't want to put a bunch of things on extinction at the same time. Uh, that's not going to be productive. Work on one thing at a time, one thing at a time. But if there are tantrums uh, and if the function has been found to be something that extinction will work well with, and that's the key, uh, because there are some cases where ignoring it, for instance, if it was automatically reinforcing, if there's something about it that's pleasurable to the child, putting it on extinction is going to give them more opportunity to do it. It's going to make it worse. So use extinction wisely with help and support. And I mean, both from a BCBA who is experienced in autism, but also gather your troops to help you when you put something on extinction. If you know that the tantrum is happening in the grocery store and you're putting it on extinction, you know what the function is. At least the first couple of times you go to the grocery store, you should have somebody with you to help you. Um, and if that's not possible, at least be mindful of it and know that you're probably going to the grocery store and you're not going to get groceries.
you're going to deal with a tantrum and that you're going to come home grocery list and be prepared for that. There were a couple of times that I had to go to the grocery store at two o'clock in the morning to be prepared because we were going through a series of things to put a behavior on extinction in a grocery store. And I would get frustrated to the point where I would be in tears because I would think I've got to have food to cook dinner. I got to lead a life. I can't, you know, right. We've all been there, but you know, your life is so much better. If somebody has said to you, an experienced expert has said, we're going to put this behavior on extinction. I want you to know that you got to take a big, deep breath and go, okay, I probably am facing a week of torture. Um, but after that, my life is going to be so much better that I'm willing to do this and get serious about it and uphold the rules of the extinction so that you get to that freedom from that challenging behavior. I promise you, it's it, when you're working with the right people and they've identified the right function of the behavior, extinction, when it's properly used, oh, it's like getting to go on vacation the week after. <laughs> The, the week you're doing it, not fun, but the week after is great. Okay, and if you're still confused about extinction, stick around because it'll start to make more and more sense as we continue to talk. All right, uh, we always have a question of the day for you. And, uh, you know, we're talking about challenging behavior all this week. So I want to know from you, what challenging behavior is your child engaging in that you would like to change? We talked about this yesterday. What are your big five? Go ahead, list five. What's happening in your house or in your classroom that you say to yourself, man, if I could just change that, because I got to tell you, it's possible. It's entirely possible. And the thing about it is, and I, and I know you're going to think that I'm just blowing smoke at you, but I'm not, is that it's entirely possible that it's something that could be changed in as little as a week. Now, there are some behaviors, I'm going to be honest with you, that take a much longer period of time, but there are a lot of behaviors that it happens very, very quickly. Now, a week is a long period of time while you're living through it, but once it's over, whew, if you could look at two of the five behaviors that are really kicking your can and they could be gone in the next two weeks because we want to take one at a time how different would your life be i want you to go ahead and fantasize for a minute what would your life look like if that were the case and i and i have to say you know I, it's not that we don't have any challenging behavior at our household right now because we do uh <laughs> but we have so much less and I also want to tell you that I look at the challenge of behavior in a different way because I know it doesn't come to stay. We yesterday was the first afternoon that we have had homework and, and since, you know, school left out, we started school last Thursday and yesterday was the first day of homework and oh my goodness. Some challenging behavior came back. Um, challenging behavior that I thought was gone, but you know, my child did not want to do the homework. And he's in fourth grade, typical fourth grade, completely neurotypical fourth grade. And clearly there has been a step up of what is going to happen in fourth grade. Um, and there was a little bit of a, a balk, shall we say, that he just went, I don't think so. And um, he was going to try every possible thing in his bag of tricks to see, can I get out of this? And you know what? Um, there was a time when I would have been in tears and hysteria. Um, I wasn't. I just looked at it and went, okay, uh, how long do I want this behavior to go? I want it to be quick. I want it to be over soon. And we've already dealt with uh, behavior with homework before. And I knew that I needed to have clear boundaries and stay patient and not get emotionally involved. After we were done with homework, I made dad take him swimming so that I could have a moment to myself. But, um, I, you know, what's different for me, and I want to go, I'll go back to this idea. What's different for me is that I know it's not to, it doesn't, it's not going to stay. I'm not going to do a whole year with homework issues. I know that it probably is going to take us this whole week of being really, really clear with our consequences, not having unrealistic expectations, um, and not being emotionally involved. Um, and it's going to be nipped. And even after we were done yesterday and I said, you know, I said to him afterwards, so how difficult was that? And he said, it really wasn't. And I said, so we could have been done a half an hour ago and you could have already been swimming or playing video games or whatever. And he said, yeah. Um, so hopefully today, 
you know, as we keep those consequences really clearly defined and, um, you know, I got to be patient with myself. It's not easy, but I know now that it's not to stay. And that is a wonderful, wonderful gift to know that you, you know, you're not stuck. Sometimes it feel, I can remember feeling like, oh my gosh, is this the rest of my life? Cause I don't know if I can do that. Um, but I don't have to do it the rest of my life. I just have to deal today and this week and he will change his behavior. So, uh, I would love to know from you, what challenging behavior, uh, is your child engaging in that you would really like to change? Cause if you really want to change it, um, there's a way to do it. Uh, each child, each behavior different, right? But there is a way for you to change that challenging behavior. Okay. Uh, we always have a topic of the day. And of course I've given away what our topic for this week is. It is of course, challenging behavior. And this is a whole host of things, right? Uh, this is hitting and kicking and biting and not complying and not going to sleep, getting up out of bed, uh, you know, having toileting challenges, um, you name it, right? What it could be absolutely whatever is creating an issue in your life. That's the challenging behavior we want to talk about. So write into us on Facebook at about 1020 today. I'm going to visit what your answers to the question were. And hopefully this week we're going to be pulling some people in to talk about those challenging behaviors. So um, stay tuned. All right. And to that end today, we have some very interesting topics uh, coming up for you. We have a motor tip for you in just a few minutes. We have our healthy eating tip of uh, the week, always on Tuesday morning. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a special guest who's going to be joining us via Skype, Michonne Reynolds. And I've got the book here if I can reach outside of our camera frame. Oh, and I just spilled tea everywhere. We're going to go to break in a second. Uh, <laughs> It's live. Um, and my Android phone is as wet as it could be. Do you see? Anyway. Oh, how nice. This is the book. Uh, teach, uh, a complete guide to teaching those with autism. Art. Teaching art excuse me, I'm flustered, uh, to those with autism. So Michonne Reynolds is going to be with us at 11 o'clock today. We'll look forward to talking to her and talking about this amazing book and why it might be of interest to you. We'll be back after these messages. Welcome. We're here with Cecilia Knight. She is the director of training for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. So it's a rare treat to have her here. And right now I want to talk about self-stimulatory behavior. Well, I guess textbook, we're looking at any ritualistic or stereotypical behavior that uh, a child engages in repetitively. The thought is the more appropriate replacement behaviors that we teach, the more those items become more reinforcing and give the child access to whether it's visual stimulation or auditory stimulation or tactile stimulation. So those now more appropriate activities would be um, more reinforcing. So it's important to teach something that competes mm -hmm. and that is more fun than engaging in the self-stimulatory behavior. All self-stimulatory behavior is automatically reinforced, meaning the behavior itself feels good for whatever reason. I have no visual stimulation, so I flap my hand in front of my eye and now I have visual stimulation. So you're looking for a replacement that matches. I had a little girl one time who um, was not talking but was singing and it was very repetitive and the same song over and over. Music became a big interest. So when we gave her a voice to have a conversation, the vocal stereotypy decreased dramatically. find that sometimes parents are hesitant or resistant to replacing a self-stimulatory behavior? Yes. It's very difficult to always be looking out for that self-stimulatory behavior. 
I do think you have to help a parent understand that those things like riding the scooter will eventually um, replace the self-stimulatory behavior. A lot of us have been there. That's not where we want to be. It just felt like, wow, I'm going to take away the thing that makes him feel okay and he's working so hard That's and doing right. this. But also know that that's the point of intervention, is not to take away all the things that are reinforcing to the child, but to give them other options that are more appropriate. It's difficult to engage with your child many times in a self-stimulatory behavior mm -hmm. um, because there's a pattern or routine and it's hard to engage with them. So trying to you know, bring them into activities that are reinforcing with others. Where did they go? Oh, nice job. He needs a nose too. Where does his nose go? What else? What else does he need? Bug. My potato. Welcome back. We're, we're continuing to mop up the studio after, if you just joined us, I just spilled tea all over the world because um, <laughs> I'm getting used to the new setup of the studio. And uh, what can I tell you? It's live. And I was mentioning that at 11 o'clock today, we are going to have uh, Michonne Reynolds with us via Skype. And she is the author of A Complete Guide to Teaching Art to Those with Autism, Utilizing the Elements and Principles of Design and Life Skills. So we're going to be talking with Michonne about why this book may be of use to you. It's a really very comprehensive book. Uh, we'll talk about what that could do for you. All right, I'm going to put that there for now. It is time for the motor tip of the week. And uh, as I'm just seeing tea everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Okay. Um, all right. So your child is more than likely, depending on their age, they're uh, in school or everybody is going back to school around them. Like some of the, the children that they might have access to are going back to school. So whether you have a preschooler or uh, somebody who, you know, is in eighth grade, the schedule changes at this time of year for them and for those around them and you know we we see that um our children are supposed to at school get a certain amount of physical activity and uh, that's fine and that's all well and good and your child might be included in adaptive physical education or they might be included with the rest of the class to do something with physical education but uh, because the hours of the day change there's a likelihood that there is going to be some anxiety that comes along with the schedule change, right? And part of it uh, can be alleviated, this is like a win-win situation, by giving them a little bit more gross motor activity. So that's what I want to talk about because, you know, I'm seeing this with my son too, that we've gone back to school. School starts at 8.15 and he gets out at 3.05. That's a really long day to pay attention, right, um, for anyone by the way, not just a child on the autism spectrum, but in particular a child on the autism spectrum, especially after a summer where hopefully we've had them engage in more activities. Um, so how do we balance that with school? And I want to advocate that uh, all of us hopefully live in a place where there is access within, you know, a 20 mile drive, let's say, to some sort of a uh, school or a playground or a park park that has one of those structures in it. Um, and if, if that is not your reality, we can talk about what you can do if it's not. But those structures are designed, whether it is something that is from the 1920s or something that just got put in last week, they are all designed to be at least visually stimulating to a child that makes them want to do a whole series of gross motor movements that are of benefit to them. I think it's really important with our kids on the autism spectrum to take them to play on those structures. I will be honest with you, I did not get the importance of that deeply enough when my child was younger. And I see now that I, I, it's one of the things I wish I could go back and do differently. Let's be honest about that. Uh, I don't want to beat myself up about about it, but there are a whole series of gross motor movements that our children want to learn and develop and grow as they're growing. And uh, some of those, including, I made a list of them here, uh, spinning and jumping, pulling, turning, grasping, uh, 
pushing, a whole series of different large muscle movements that they really want to protect, uh, perfect. You know, then we get into, uh, with the fine motor things like twisting the bottle cap, those, those kinds of things. But the huge gross motor kinds of things are what those playground jungle gyms really address. The whole idea of a child going to a bar and being able to support their own weight by holding themselves up, you know, those, those monkey um, bar kinds of things. Um, but first to holding themselves up, then pulling themselves up, you know, those large muscle groups of those kinds of things. How about, you know, climbing upstairs and then being able to push on the top stair as they're bringing their leg up. It's a lot of coordination and a lot of gross motor stuff. And if there are other children, sometimes they will be pushed to do things that they find difficult. I think we want to support our children while, while they're going to the park and doing those kinds of things. It's an opportunity to work on social stuff. Uh, two years ago, we were living in a place that had a wonderful, wonderful jungle gym and the kids would all go there on a daily basis. It was a great social opportunity for my son. And the first time we took him, this is when I realized, ah, oh, I've not done enough of this. We were really focused on the therapy and we didn't do enough of this because the other kids who were his age were just used to scrambling all over this thing like it was nothing. And my son had to think it through. Um, and they would play a game. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. It was something like quicksand, but all the sand around the, the play equipment was the quicksand. And one person, it was like quicksand and crab or something like that. One person, person was the crab on the sand and they were the only one who was allowed to walk on the sand and they had to try to touch someone on the structure but they couldn't keep they had to be blindfolded I, there were all these rules um, but it was a great social opportunity for him and when he was not the crab when he was the person on the jungle gym you had to be able to climb and move around things and be quiet and um, it really tasked him. Um, and it was not a game that I could have come up with. It was just, I, I think it was a game that uh, the kids, it may, might have been something that somebody knew some rules to and then they changed a bunch of rules to it and it sort of was for that particular play structure. Um, but what a wonderful opportunity for him and I want to encourage all of you. You may go and each time you go you may see different children at the park but it's very rare to go to a park and have no one else there, right? Um, but encourage your child by finding, let them go. You know, in the beginning, let them go and see what they're attracted to. And it may be that they're attracted to the other child or that they have no interest in the other child. But is there a color that they're attracted to? Is there an apparatus that they're attracted to? Sometimes they're attracted to the thing that they are going to be able to do. And that's okay. And let them, you know, the first time or two, let them express themselves with that thing. But sometimes they're attracted to the thing that they don't have the skills to do. And there's a level of frustration. So really support them in that. And help them to, you know, if they, if they want to climb up the bars and they really just don't have the skills to do it, be very soothing and patient with them and physically model, pick up their hand and move it to the next thing. They're going to express some fear and some emotion, but you can be talking to them very soothingly to let them know that it's okay because they chose it, right? <laughs> Remember, if they chose it, don't make them go too fast, right? Be kind and gentle and supportive, but keep bringing them back, give them the opportunity. Um, and if it's at their school, so much the better because having that opportunity after school to play on that structure and get more proficient at it will help them to be more social when they're there during recess and lunch playing on the structure. So take advantage of those things. Now, if you don't have one, if there isn't something that is close to you, make a jungle gym in your yard or make a jungle gym in your living room. Um, you know, whether it's, we, there are these wonderful commercials that were playing during the Olympics of the, the, the girl who, it looks frightening and I don't want you to do this, but you know, she was a gymnast and so she's walking the balance beam on the back of the couch and then she's going between the two counters and almost knocking the glass off the counter. I don't even know what it's an advertisement for, but make a jungle gym in your house. So you can put a piece of tape on the floor and tell the child that they need to walk on the floor um, and have it be the balance beam. We used to walk in a neighborhood that had just the very short brick wall that was about this far off the ground, a little itty bitty brick wall that separated um, from people's roses. And there, there was one lady and I would have my son walk it like it was a balance beam because it's really great for a gross motor, that core strength to be walking and, and, and your eyes 
eyes where your eyes are focusing. It's really great, great activity for our kids. And there was one woman who came out and said, I really don't want him walking on that. And I apologized and said, okay, we won't. And she said, well, why would you let him do that anyway? And I said, because, you know, we, we live in a place that doesn't have a playground and he really needs to work on this skill. And we've been doing it on the floor with tape. And she went, you know what? You let him walk on that. You come back every day and you walk on that. And she said, but try not to let him fall in my bushes, okay? And I said, absolutely. Um, so, you know, sometimes people don't understand what you're doing, but if you explain to them, uh, she was like, you absolutely, you come back here every day. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, so in any case, take your child to one of those places. I, like I said, if it's at their school, so much the better. Um, but if you don't have one of those things, find the way, find the way. I know you can, uh, create it in your house, be creative, but give them the opportunity to be pulling themselves up, having to throw a leg over something. I didn't do enough of that when he was little. Um, but no matter what age a child is, it's important. They got to get their yayas out. The schedule has changed. It'll help with a whole host of things, including anxiety, and help them to be tired out so that they go to bed. Amen to that, right? <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break. I'm going to mop up some more, and we're going to come back with our healthy eating tip of the week. So stick with us. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, and this is my son, Jem. We're here today at the Home Depot. You might know that Home Depot is famous for giving free classes to adults on lots of things like tiling and other home crafts. Well, they also have free classes for kids as well. It's called the Kids Workshop. We love doing that, don't we, Jem? Yeah. It's cool. So come on inside with us, and let's do a craft. Yay. The Kids Workshop is a program that's been around with Home Depot um, almost since we've been a company and it's been developed to allow kids in the community to come in and give them an opportunity to build something, to be able to create something and uh, be able to take just simple wood pieces and put them together with nails and hammers and screwdrivers and then paint them. So you do this every first Saturday of the month. Any Home Depot that you go to on the first Saturday of every month between 9 and 12, you can join uh, different associates throughout different stores and, and build these projects with these kids. And do they have to do anything before? beforehand or can they just show up on that Saturday? All they need to do is show up. We, we have all the tools, all the, the materials that the kids will need. We have aprons that we give to the kids that they can take home and uh, maintain their pins. They get pins on a regular basis for completing projects. With that, they can keep track of how many projects they've done. And, uh, and it's all free? It's all absolutely free. All Which provided. is wonderful. And absolutely. Wilson, I have to say, you know, you, you guys devise this for all kids to be able to do this. Correct. What I particularly love about it as an autism mom, it gives my child a place to come and learn a new skill to socialize with kids of all kinds. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for. Home Depot is definitely uh, loves to be involved with the community and bring the community in to work with us. That's what we love to do. Welcome back to Autism Live. It's that time of the week where we take on the healthy eating tip. And because we're all going back to school, have either gotten there or going in the coming weeks, I wanted to take on school lunches uh, to talk about how do we make this a reinforcing time for our kids and make it healthy and make it so they don't get picked on. It's a tall order. <laughs> it's a very tall order. But um, there are lots of different things that we can do. And um, I, I one of the things that we're trying to do in our house is to automate it, to make it as quick as possible, to have a series of choices um, that mom and dad can make that are all going to be wonderful, that he's going to want to participate in all of them, but that it doesn't take a great deal of forethought. I don't want to reinvent the wheel every night or every morning, depending on when we pack the lunch. And, you know, so I really subscribe to the idea that if we pack it at night, it, it makes the morning that much less hectic, except that you can't always right there are some things that you got to pack in the morning otherwise they're gonna get soggy and then they won't be edible um, so keeping that in mind um, but 
let's start first of all with usually there has to be a snack that you have to pack and there has to be a lunch that you have to pack let's start with the beverages because it's really important that our kids hydrate and and the package in which they hydrate is sometimes as important as what's in it Um, because there is I'm sorry and I don't love to talk about this but there is the cool factor at school and when our kids bring things um, that are too outside the norm the other kids it just becomes one more thing to separate your child. And I wish that that wasn't the case. And can I tell you, for years, I was like, well, everybody else is just going to have to get over it. And everybody's just going to have to educate their kids. And I had that tactic. Guess what? That didn't work because everybody didn't educate their kids and they didn't get over it. And and now I have a child who is aware enough that he comes home and says, hey, they're making fun of what I'm eating, which, you know, and I can talk to him up, down, and sideways and say, well, but you like it. So what do you care what they think? But he does. And I'm grateful that he does because that's a sign that he's becoming more and more aware of what other people think, which I want, right? So how do we help our kids through all of this? Start with what they drink. You know, water is a really good run-of-the-mill thing and there's nothing wrong with having water, but it will your child drink it is, is the big question. More and more, they're having juice boxes that contain things that are organic and that are at least, sometimes they have juices that are watered down, that have coconut water in them um, or just regular water. So look in your local stores to find, you know, if you're going to do a juice box, I encourage you to do organic. Um, it is more expensive and I don't necessarily love all the waste that's involved in the juice box but uh, you know if that's what you what you need to do and you know maybe you can split the difference and send water in in like the snack and the juice box in the lunch uh, you know consider what is healthiest for your child that your child will actually take part in because it can be something it can be the healthiest thing on the face of the earth but if it keeps coming home in the lunch box unopened what's the point, right? Um, So take a couple of minutes to think, take your child to the store and see what they will gravitate towards. Experiment, but when you find something that works, buy it in bulk. Buy it in bulk so that you have it. And if you have a couple of different choices of things, so much the better. Now, one of the things that we have found this year, and I meant to bring one with me, but um, you probably have seen those tubes of applesauce that they sell absolutely everywhere. You can even get them in gas stations sometimes now. I'm amazed at where these things have shown up. They're just little squeezable. They have a very round top on them. You take the top off and they squeeze and it's applesauce. Wonderful. But I want to encourage you that there are some that they make that are not only apple sauce, excuse me, um, but are also organic applesauce. And then beyond that, there is a company that's called Mashups that has made them in these really colorful packages that you can buy a case. I think there's six in a case. And what they've done is take, it's not just fruit, they took vegetables and snuck it into the fruit. Oh, can I get an amen? <laughs> So uh, there's two in particular. My son can't have strawberries uh, because he's allergic to them. So there are four different flavors and there are two that have strawberries in them that he can't have. But there's one that he has that is a carrot one. And so it's orange and it has carrots in it, but it also has mangoes and apricots and a little bit of apple in it. It's all organic and he loves them. And it he, everybody in the lunchroom has them now, but his is a little bit more colorful and it's a little more expensive, I'm gonna be honest with you, Um, but it has the vegetables in it. So he can squeeze that and be getting a full serving of carrot along with a little bit of fruit. Um, And I can feel better about that as a parent. And then he has another one that's, it's called Blueberry Blitz, I think, and it's purple, but there are no artificial colors in it because you know what they colored it with? They put a little bit of blueberry and they put some purple carrot in it. And then there's orange carrot in it too. apple. You gotta love 
that. So it's like a treat for them. They think that they're getting mostly fruit, um, but they're getting a, an equal portion of fruit and vegetable and they are durable so that I can buy them in bulk ahead of time so that they're there and you can have different flavors of them and you can throw one into the lunchbox and it's socially acceptable for the kids on the playground up to, I don't know, we'll get to fifth grade and maybe those are no, no longer cool. We'll see. Uh, but up to fourth grade, I can tell you they're still relatively cool. Uh, so there you've got a fruit and a vegetable mixed in one in a really easy package. Yeah, I'm sure that in terms of staying green, the packaging, I don't know. Uh, but we're, you know, we got to do what we got to do. Uh, so then we get into other things that you can pack. There are now all kinds of chips and things that you can pack that are healthier than ever. You can get sweet potato chips. But again, if your child won't eat them, there's no point. Go to your local health food store, take a tour around, ask them if they do any kind of sampling a day when you can come and bring your child and try things. Because uh, usually they have at least, you know, once every three months, something where they're going to sample things. And, and especially this time of year, they're trying to sell these things to go in kids' lunch boxes and they can't can't expect you to pay six dollars for a, a bag of chip chips and take them home and your child won't eat them um, my son is right now eating the olive chips that are um I'm trying to think, uh, the name of the company is Food Should Taste Good. <laughs> you gotta love that, right? And they have a version that is gluten-free, casein-free. It's corn, which we're now reintroducing to him and it has olives in it and he just loves them. Um, there are other, depending on what your child likes, there's a whole range of things and what your child can have. There are things called skinny french fries. My son can't have them because of all things they have milk in them. But um, if your child can have milk, maybe it's something that they can have. There's a wide range of things. Um, so go to the store, see what they will eat, see what they will like. I always encourage you though to send some fresh vegetables. I think that's the hardest thing because they're not going to stay good for long. Um, but uh, it's a time of year when you can get organic peppers in all different colors of the rainbow. If your child will eat those, they're a little on the sweet side, so I think that their kids are more likely to have them. Um, and cut them in shapes, cut them in, you know, different, you can, you can take and uh, take the end of um, like an apple core and make circles uh, with them. You can take a cookie cutter and do, uh, f in fact, we did a cooking show where we made, we took peppers and made leaves out of them and stuck them on skewers and uh, so that you could dip them. Maybe we, you know, can start showing that again, Emily, but uh, cut them into different shapes or just cut them into strips or sometimes it's great to cut them the long ways so they make uh, like they look like flowers, uh, depending on what your child likes. Try the stuff out at home and notice what comes back in the lunchbox, but be mindful of being the healthiest that you can be, keeping a carb, uh, a fruit or vegetable, or a fruit and vegetable mixed together, and a protein, so that it's a well-balanced, you're asking them to make the choice while they're there though, so notice what comes back. And you'll see that some things are popular and some things aren't. Uh, we actually are giving a sticker, I showed you on the sticker chart, chart that we did last week, and part of what he has to do in order to get his sticker for lunch and recess is to have eaten at least half of what I send. At least half. Um, because it's a very social time for him and I want him to participate in the social thing, but I also see that if he doesn't eat half, that we get to the last part of the day and he doesn't earn that sticker because he doesn't have enough fuel to get through it. So in any case, be mindful, put fun things into the lunchbox. If you uh, can put a note into the lunchbox to encourage them to have a good day, if they're already at the point where they're reading, um, there are little taped things that you can get a, a little thing, even at Build-A-Bear, you can record something and put it into the lunchbox. Uh, make it something for them to look forward to. Um, and as healthy as you can manage, but stuff that they'll eat. All right, uh, it's that time of the day when we show you the A word. This is now the second episode of the A word. We're going back and watching from the beginning, but you can watch the whole series on their very own YouTube channel. Uh, but I love this episode because it is that horrible, difficult waiting period of saying, I know what my child has, 
I know what my child uh, needs and it hasn't started yet. How come? Uh, it's a really difficult time and everybody goes through it in some way, shape or form. And this is a very honest look at what it's like when your world is the A word. So take a look. speak or make much noise at all during the evaluation. They knew that on that day. I, I can't comprehend for the life of me why it would even take a month to start speech therapy. That doesn't make any sense to me. The waiting's hard. The waiting's really hard. We read things about how the brain is so much more malleable the younger they are. You know, every day that ticks by just seems like a waste of time. You know, you go on the websites and you read all these things and and there's kind of a club, I think, of moms who call themselves autism warriors. <laughs> And I hated that word when I first read it. I hated it. I still do. Because I don't, you know, there's a lot of things I wanted to fight for, but I didn't want to have to fight for autism. Yeah. It's okay, man. We're lucky in that he sprints to mom. Okay, this is how my son reacts to me coming home. Oh, Jack Riley. Hi! sprints to me when I get home and uh, and he he kisses you and hugs you. <laughs> Where's my son? <laughs> One of the first people that I told when we got the diagnosis was a good friend of mine who knew somebody who had a, an adopted son who has autism and had not only fought the fight, I mean talk about autism warrior, this woman founded a whole foundation and was extremely active and extremely knowledgeable and my friend put me on the phone with her. She was the one who turned me on to both ABA and to CARD and to tell me how valuable it was and we're very grateful for it because yes. we, we realized that had we not been given information we never would have known. The original center would not have recommended that for us so it, it, it required us to really really push to get what we wanted and I didn't know even until I asked the question if I had a choice. I thought this was great advice. Don't ever feel at, that you're at the mercy of the regional center because they're paying for your services. She told me, you're paying for your services. They're using tax money to do this and you've paid taxes. Intake at CARB was actually a much more pleasant experience than the regional center evaluation. I think in part because we've been through it once and, and it wasn't as scary for us. It was a good experience for us because we felt like our son was himself. He had all the same things going on as far as autism is concerned, but he was still bright and happy and affectionate. I felt like he showed them both his, his good sides and, and the sides that he needs to work on. So for us, it felt good because we felt like at least people were seeing what we see. I felt maybe for the first time that they got it, that it's like, okay, uh, he, he is this way, this is what he's got going on, but we, we can make this better. At first, it was exhausting to think that every single thing was a teaching moment that every single thing that he did, and I know that, you know, I would say something to him, and he'd be like, really? <laughs> Can we just feed him? Can yeah. we just feed him dinner? We don't have to worry about it. But now even that's not as exhausting because it's sort of starting to become more natural for us mm -hmm. so that it doesn't feel as awful. Well, I remember feeling guilty just for being with him all day and then, you know, just sort of sneak the TV on to Sports Center in the afternoon, and he's playing with his Legos, and I just back up and lean against the sofa with him between my feet. But I wasn't really watching him. I would just try to watch Sports Center for a few minutes, and then I'd always feel guilty and and uh, try to get over that. <laughs> so no more guilt. I think we're teammates. Um, that's the the best thing. Is I feel like she's on my side. I'm on her side. We sort of, uh, we've been lucky that my weak moments are his strong moments. Well, on a personal note, is the camera still on? It is. <laughs> on a personal note, um, I would be lost. Um, she, she really dove in. And I mean, I googled autism, and I still don't understand it until she explains it to me. Um, 
Okay. Which is scary because I don't really understand it. Well, that's the point. But she, she dives to the next step. Um, and I'm just starting to understand the last step. And she's trying to explain the next step. And um, I told her last night I would be lost if she wasn't doing that. Because I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I could. Sometimes I'm reading these things and, and uh, it just floats over me because I'm, I go numb again reading about it. Well, I think, in, in, in fairness, I, I think one one person in each family has to take that role. Because yeah. I don't think you can both drive. I think there's always somebody in every family who just takes takes that role. Yeah. If somebody takes charge, take a back seat. <laughs> that's, that's the moral of that. I mean that too. <laughs>
And I can look at that for that dad and say, well, you, you have to be able to watch ESPN every once in a while. And we talked yesterday about how, you know, in reducing stress, you have to remember who you are in this battle. You cannot give so much of yourself in autism that you lose yourself in, in your entirety. Um, and I have seen people that have done that. And, and can I tell you that it was somebody who was much further along and their child had already finished all their ABA and was going to high school that said to me, whatever you do, don't lose yourself in this because it's what you're doing with ABA is so good. The day is going to come when you don't need it anymore and your child is going to go on with their life and you have to have some life left that isn't just autism. Um, besides which, even if that weren't the case, we can't come to our children and give everything and give everything if we don't ever take five minutes for ourselves. We have to. But yeah, we feel guilty about it. I still feel guilty about it. Um, you know, my husband and I were talking last night about how he was saying uh, the way that our schedule works, he is home uh, now during the day when my son is at school and I'm here and I leave here and I go pick up my son from school. So my, my husband has had some alone time. Uh, now, the, the trade off is, is that I get time with my son at night sometimes when my husband is working, um, but he gets some downtime and his thing is he would like more family time. We'd all like that, right? And my thing is that I where I would like to have 10 minutes to myself that's not in the car, but he identified it and said, yes, but you're not willing to give up 10 minutes with him. And I went, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, because I feel guilty. I feel guilty when I do, but I need to because I can't come 100% and be with my child 100% if part of me is hasn't relaxed, hasn't been me, hasn't had some downtime. So I mentioned that last night my husband took him swimming while I had a little bit of time after the homework to just go, oof, mindless, uh, not watching ESPN, but you know, the, the equivalent for me. Um, so I, I so appreciate that that dad said what we all experience, that moment of thinking, Ugh, you know, what is 100%? Um, and I, and I want to caution all of us, myself included, that 100% does not mean that your every single moment is with your child. That's not healthy for anybody. And you need to take those ESPN moments from time to time. And I would also tell you that one of the things that I know has happened in this family is that they, when the team came in and started ABA, they taught the child to be able to play happily by himself for periods of time in which the parents can go to the bathroom, uh, can start to prepare dinner, can watch a couple of minutes of ESPN. And that's one of the great things that happens with ABA. And so when you see your child playing happily by themselves for a period of time, we're not talking days and hours and, you know, uh, weeks on end, uh, but for a period of time, it's very healthy for a child to be able to play for 10 minutes by themselves uh, and to work that period of time up. Um, but I, I so appreciate that moment. Um, and even at this point where, you know, we're done with ABA therapy and, uh, in terms of intensively in the home, I'm still using skills and, and my husband is still participating and we're using the principles of ABA with our son. Um, but our intensive ABA intervention is over. And I, and I'm still at a point where when I saw that dad say that I got emotional cause I could really relate to it. And I think that most of us can, uh, uh, so we acknowledge the guilt and we move through it and and we look at each other and it's so much easier for me to say to that dad, don't feel guilty about that. You get to still be a person and you get to still want to watch ESPN and it's all right and it doesn't hurt him. It actually helps Jack Riley because then you come back a person um, and that's as important as anything else for that little boy. Uh, and I can say that to that dad, oof, so much harder when I got to do it myself, right?
So really appreciate the A word for that so that we can all take a look at what we're doing and know we're not alone. All right, uh, we are gonna take a break. When we come back, we are going to look at the answers to the question of the day. We asked you, what challenging behavior is your child engaging in that you really wish that you could change? Now's a great time to go to Facebook, go to Twitter, and tell us what it is you're, you're wanting to work on because throughout the rest of this week, those are the kinds of things that we want to address. We also had two questions, one that came in over the weekend and one that came in over the night that we're going to address as well. So stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some guesses? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm just looking at some stuff going on on Facebook. Um, woo, there's some stuff going on. Uh, we might need to talk about that more than the answer to the question of the day because I see you guys are really logging in to talk about 
uh, a new study. Uh, but let's look at the question of the day first, shall we? <laughs> um, what challenging behavior is your child engaging in that you would like to change? Uh, and somebody wrote in and said, I wouldn't change a thing. I love my son for who he is. And you know what? I so appreciate that. Um, we're not talking about changing who your child is, though. We're talking about changing challenging behavior. Um, but if your child isn't having any challenging behavior, then woohoo, you know? And I also want to say that that is the reality for a lot of people with children on the autism spectrum, that if you're working on things and targeting behavior, um, that you don't have to be in a situation where you're constantly having to deal with challenging behavior. Uh, but uh, we're not trying to change anybody from being who they are, though, just trying to change some of their challenging behavior that prevents you from having a life, prevents them from having a life, and prevents them from learning or being safe or keeping others around them being safe safe. Um, Ooh, okay, so this next person wrote in and said, quietly sneaking out of places. Yeah, that's a challenging behavior. And they put fleeing. Um, ooh, was missing from classroom twice, thinking it's funny to hide. It's the lack of language, not asking to do things and going to do them on his own. Well, I have to say that I really appreciate that you understand that there is a lack of functional communication there um, and not asking to do things and, and just going to do them on their own and that's really wonderful but especially when it's sneaking out of the classroom huge huge uh worry and fear as a parent oh my gosh if my child was able to sneak out of the classroom twice i they'd pretty much have to sedate me because i i wouldn't want to be leaving him at school i would be really concerned um i hope that you have been asking for an FBA, and it sounds like you already have an idea of the reasons why he's doing that, but an FBA and then a behavior intervention plan for the classroom so that they're taking all the precautions necessary so that he cannot sneak out of a room quietly, and that B, that there are consequences that are always consistent so that you're not you know, having a situation where somebody is further feeding the behavior when it's happening and that there is a set uh, intervention that happens as a result of it happening so that it isn't the big excitement that it currently is. I hope that you're taking the time to do that. And I want to say, too, before everybody jumps and says, you know, what is the teacher doing? And I love that, you know, you're not saying that, you know, you're, and you're really specifying quietly sneaking out of class. Um, before, I, you know, former classroom teacher, but not the early grades, I have to say, you know, I taught college and I taught junior high and high school for a little while. And I remember when my son went off to preschool thinking, um, you know, I'm terrified that my son's just going to walk out because I don't know that he wouldn't. And uh, I'm just absolutely terrified. And then I spent some time in the classroom and and he went off to school with a card aid so I knew he wasn't going to go out the classroom door and I felt incredibly comfortable and I was like it's all going to be okay because Peter Farrig is with him and nothing can happen right I was just so like woohoo because Peter's there but I knew that at some point Peter wasn't going to be there anymore and that kept me awake at night <laughs> and um and it was interesting to me because Peter left the classroom in February when, when my son was in, in uh, preschool. But I went and I volunteered a lot because I thought that that was important as a parent to see what was happening in the classroom and to be there and to be helpful and supportive. And um, it was on Halloween that I was there and there were five other parents and uh, the aide, who uh, Peter, who was assigned to my child, so he was paying attention to my child, but Peter has a pretty far reaching grasp of, you know, what's happening on with a lot of the children, although that's not his responsibility in the classroom. And two of the most wonderful preschool teachers I have ever run across uh, in this classroom. And five extra parents on the day of Halloween, including myself. And I think of myself as being incredibly capable, being very aware of what children do, and being very on it. And uh, we were outside and doing something and came, I think it was the Halloween parade, and came back in to have the little Halloween party, and everybody was videotaping, and there were cameras everywhere, and all was wonderful until 
and procedures were in place and procedures were followed. Can I just tell you? Um, and I was the person who was standing at the door when a, uh, when a woman walked in, having come through the gate, through the playground, with one of the little kids in the class, who, by the way, was completely neurotypical. And she said, does this little boy belong in this classroom? And I was the person who was standing there, and I said, yes, where did you find him? And she said, oh, he was walking out along the road. I just can't even tell you. Uh, like, I shook for two days. I think we all shook for two days. The, one of the teachers was absolutely hysterical, and she said, I, 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 and I said, no, 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 no. I was here. I was here. I saw how on it you were. I don't know where this child went. I was here. I don't know where the child. I don't know how the child got out the door. I don't know how he timed it. There were two teachers, an aide, and five parents. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, and I said, I literally think it's the configuration of the way things are set up that he was able to get out. This is, you know, th this is beyond human error. Um, so when a kid is determined um, and if a room, is, if, you know, if a setup isn't uh, a certain way and they took extra precautions to make sure that that could never happen again. Um, there was a, a lock put on a gate so that you know, if the child, because they can't change the structure of the building, but they could change the structure of the, the gate and they put a lock on the gate. Um, but I'm just going to tell you that, like, kids who are determined, it can happen. Um, but there needs to be somebody working on that functional communication skill, knowing what the function of the behavior is, knowing when it happens so that you can head it off at the pass, and consequences, and I don't mean punishment, by the way. But we don't want to be rewarding that elopement, right? Um, and what happens a lot is when a child goes away and, it, you know, even if it's 10 feet and the person finds them, there's a certain amount of tension that happens. And if it is attention driven, then we get into extinction that we do not give, you know, and, and there's that urge from the parents, you know, you want to hug the child and say, I'm so glad to see you and all of that. But if that's why the child is escaping, and it gets put on extinction, then you don't do that. Really, really tough. But I hope that you're getting the amount of help and support that you need. Okay, I want to go to one of the other sites. Um, okay, looking here to see the answers to your question of the day. The question of the day is what challenging behaviors uh, is your child engaged in? This is a whole different setup now, and I don't know why that is. I think my Facebook has done things that I don't want it to do. Hmm. Let's try again. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, my goodness. There's just controversy on Facebook. If you're on Facebook and seeing what I'm seeing, it's uh, giving me some pause here. Let's go and see if I can get my Facebook to work now. No, I'm having problems. Uh, and it may be that we just go and answer the two questions that I wanted to answer and come back to this. Um, I am able to get into one of them, though. Uh, somebody who writes in and says, when my two-year-old nonverbal son gets mad or frustrated, he makes the raspberry sound with his mouth and tongue. This raspberry gets louder and wetter when he has waited for a long time to get what he wants. Okay, and I don't mean to smile there because um, I know that for you it's incredible challenging behavior. Um, and, you know, it is amazing what a child will do in certain circumstances in order to get the thing that they want, right? Um, but I will say that when it isn't happening to us, when it's not my child, when it's not your child, a lot of times we can appreciate how really smart it is, you know, that for a two-year-old who doesn't have any words that, you know, this whole idea of doing a raspberry sound to express himself in a way, you know, there's, that's communication, right? Uh, it's not functional communication, but it's communication. And the fact that it gets louder and it gets wetter, the longer he has to wait because he's waiting you out, uh, is very potentially uh, a part of this issue. Um, and I would really, uh, you know, and, and of course we, we never, and I'm not an expert, uh, and we never want to give child specific advice anyway, because our kids are all different and, you know, um, but I would, 
be interested to know if you have the opportunity to work with someone. Are you working with a speech and language pathologist? Are you getting any early intervention? Because if your child's still two, a lot of times in some states they have um, some intervention that they give before the age of three and then at the age of three it changes. Uh, also be interested in knowing if you have insurance because this is something that with ABA could probably be changed very quickly. I don't want to assume, right? Um, but, you know, when we work on functional communication with a child, uh, what it sounds like to me with a very little bit that you've said is that there is an element of communication that's happening here, that he's letting you know, this is not working for me. And if he had a different way of saying that, uh, it might nip it. Uh, I'm also wondering too, one of the other questions that I have is that because I'm having a hard time not smiling about the idea, is there anybody in the house that is finding that funny and giving it attention uh, at, that is potentially something that is rewarding? Because, you know, when a baby does a raspberry, people tend to go, oh, isn't that so cute? And for you, it's not cute anymore. But for the rest of us, you know, uh, so is there somebody in the house, whether it's a pet or a sibling or someone else who is finding it amusing and giving it attention. Because uh, sometimes what happens is it starts out to be the protest of, you know, I want the thing, but then it gets fed by attention and now you got two functions. Uh, but I would be interested to know, are you working with somebody ABA because uh, functional communications for that child and then I think you'll find that there won't be a need for it. Okay, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the questions that we had come in. Uh, I want to go to those right now and put them up. Um, <clears throat> we had one that came in over the weekend. Uh, I'm going to show it to you now. Um, and it is, what resources are there for adults with autism? We live in Indiana, which has very little resources. Most people uh, who do treat, uh, treat him as a child. And she goes on to say, um, uh, should I teach him as a child? He will be 25 this year. And um, <clears throat> my question is about, uh, what do you mean by treating him as a child? I think it's really important that um, we take the person at the skill level that they're at and teach them at the skill level that they're at. And one of the things, I want to encourage you to take a look at skills and try a free trial for skills. Um, and, and maybe even do a little bit of the assessment to see about where your child is at. Uh, there's two factors here. There's how old your child is and how old your child is in terms of their skill level. And that may be different levels for different skills. Your child may be eight years old and their receptive language might be four years old, but their expressive language might be nine years old. You know, um, so I think it goes skill by skill level. And if you stop and consider, um, I'm just gonna take me as an example that um, I am about to be 50. But I, in, in terms of computer, um, I there are some things that I'm really good at in terms of computer. And Emily Goodwin, our technical director, will tell you that there are other things in terms of computer where I do not have the skills of a one-year-old, right? But if you were going to teach me the things that I needed to know to get to a one-year-old and a two-year-old and an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 50-year-old level with computer, I would want you to treat me, um, I, I would want you to start at the beginning, but I would want you to treat me like somebody who has skills in other areas. Do you know what I mean? Um, that just because I don't know one thing doesn't mean I don't know anything. And I do think that a lot of times our kids get viewed as because they're not good at something, they must not be good at anything and they must have no skills. And that has got to be tiresome. It really does. Although in other areas, I think that people look at our kids and see how good they are at something and they start a discussion at a level that they can't handle. And in those cases, our kids are like, hey, you know, I don't know everything. Well, I don't know everything. Um, and I don't want to be talked to as if I know everything and I don't want to be talked to as if I don't know anything. And I, I think that's a pretty universal feeling. I think you could ask just about anybody who has communication skills and they would say that. And, and if we have the communication skills to talk to a one-year-old and have them express and understand what their feelings were, I don't know, but I'm going to guess that uh, 
they would feel that way too. I've seen one-year-olds get frustrated because you want to show them to do something how that they already know how to do. And they, you know, we hear from neurotypical children, I do, I do, you know, because I want to do it. I already know how to do it. You know, and they're shoving the adult out of the way. I do, I do it. Um, but then there are other times when they need some help and support. So I think it's really important that you look at your 25 year old as an individual and that when you say teach him as a child, um, I just don't know what you mean by that. There are things when I want to be taken back to step one. If you mean that, yes, take him back to step one. If you mean, you know, treat him as if, uh, he doesn't have I'm sure at the age of 25, he, there are some things that he is above uh, the age of an eight-year-old. And I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be sure of that. But there has to be some sensibility of the fact that he has been here longer. Um, and so I think it's really important that we teach all we teach all of us as we would a child in terms of not expecting them to know more than they know. But I think even when we teach children, we have to be respectful of what they do know. So that's my answer to that. Now, in terms of the resources in Indiana, I spent a little time online yesterday and looked up to find resources on Indiana. And I, you know what? I completely understand what you mean um, when you talk about that there are little resources. Uh, I found it very frustrating. I will tell you that I first thing I wanted to do was look at where you are in terms of insurance. And I found out some really interesting things about Indiana, um, that Indiana has had autism insurance reform on the books since 2001. And I always talk about uh, Arizona as being the first one, but it appears that I could be very wrong about that, that you guys have had insurance reform on the books since 2001. And I asked a whole bunch of people, can I tell you how many times I got put on hold and forwarded to another person because I kept asking the question and people kept saying I, they didn't understand the question. And then when I posed the question in different ways, they were like, I don't know. Uh, so they kept forwarding me, but my question was, are there age limits? And if there are age limits, are there uh, dollar caps too? And they kept on saying, what do you mean on age limits? And I said, well, it appears that your law says that you will cover ABA therapy if it's not a self-funded plan. And But I want to know, like, at what age does that stop? And they kept on saying, I don't understand the question. And I kept on saying, okay, well, then let's say somebody is 25. Can they, are they eligible for this? And then they would transfer me to somebody else. So I, I hear your frustration. But I finally did get to somebody who said, on some plans, depending on what the plan is, um, there is an age limit up to the age of 26, up to and including age 26. Um, but that was for very specific types of plans. And then we got down to the discussion of, uh, but under the law and, you know, what is allowed for. And the answer that I got was that there have been many cases where insurance has been covered for people who are over the age of 26 in the state of Indiana. Now, you have to look and see if you have a self-funded plan, um, and you also have to have a doctor, uh, a primary physician, who says that it is a medical necessity to get ABA, um, and that there has to be uh, what they were referring to as a care plan, that that is the, the method in which the state of Indiana looks at it, that there is a care plan, and that the person is determining, but that it, you know, that you could be 26 years of old years of age and be eligible for whatever the doctor says is appropriate and medically necessary. That's the important thing. The doctor has to say that it's mes medically necessitated and that there is a care plan. So I want to ask you to look at that and see if uh, it is something that might be a, of use to your child then yeah, and I'm saying child, he's 25, but he's still your child, right? Um, and have a core team of people. And I'm gonna give you a number on my very tea stained and wet, it's still dripping wet, I 
<laughs> I said I'm gonna have tea here everywhere. Okay, so, and Indiana's probably not gonna love that I'm gonna give this number out, but Jennifer Akers is the name of the person from Family Voices of Indiana, and the phone number for that is 317-944-8982. Again, that's Jennifer Akers at Family Voices of Indiana. And the number is 317-944-8982. 317-944-8982. Jennifer Akers, Family Voices of Indiana. And everybody was telling me, wet, 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 T, T, T. Uh, I spilled tea earlier if you're just tuning in. All over my desk. All over everything. And my phone is still working. In any case, uh, I want to encourage you to call her if you're in the state of Indiana and talk about what the resources are and about what you need to do to figure out if you can get ABA and who you would get ABA from uh, in the state of Indiana. Depending on where you are in Indiana, um, there are different resources. So hopefully, let me know if that works for you or if you need some more support because that doesn't happen. I did not actually speak to Jennifer. I spoke to a lot of other people on the way to Jennifer who assured me that there have been cases where claims have been paid, insurance claims, for people over the age of 25. Check it out. Okay, so that's that question. We had another question. I'm just going to mark that complete. Um, and we had another question, which I'm going to be bringing in some experts later on in the week. In particular, I'm going to have... Uh, Angela Persicky is going to be with us on Thursday at 11 o'clock that I'm going to ask to come in and I'm going to see if I can get somebody in because we're not having Evil and Ghoul tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I'm going to see if I can get somebody else to come in and talk about sleep issues because a lot of you have been asking about sleep issues. Um, and this person is saying, I need help with getting my son to go to bed at night. He's four years old and only has tantrums when it's time for bed. He keeps saying five more minutes. During the day, he is fine, no behaviors. Uh, he does not like to sleep, he just wants to play with his toys. He falls to sleep from exhaustion after crying for so long. Do you have any suggestions? I'm trying to have a bedtime routine, but it does not work, please help. Okay. And again, we can never give child-specific advice because to assume that from a paragraph that we know everything that's going on in your house or that everything that your child is and does and has would be a great disservice to your child, right? Um, but let's talk a little bit about sleep issues. And as I said, I'm going to bring some experts in because I am not an expert. But I will say, and we've had some questions about this in the past, and I've heard what the experts have had to say, and I have had sleep issues in the past, and I still, still have times when I struggle getting my nine-year-old to bed and to stay in bed because he wants to stay up too. And I will tell you that part of the reason why I continue to have problems is because I do not deal with my issues around this. And the first one being that when I was a kid, I didn't want to go to sleep either. I just didn't want to. Now as an adult, I live to go to sleep. <laughs> And I find this great irony in my life because even when I was in college, I, I, you know, I would push it. I would push it and push it and push it to see how long I could stay awake. Uh, and I think I, I, I think there are a certain number of hours in your life that you have to sleep. And I, I used up all my sleepless hours, and now I just want to sleep all the time. Uh, okay, so but I have this thing where I feel my son, you know, of course, my son wants to stay up and play too. And I, I understand. And so I don't do the consequences in the way in which I have been taught to do the consequences. And that is on me. I'm not saying that that's what you're doing at all, because I don't know what you're doing. But I hear that you're trying to have a bedtime routine that does not work. And so I just want to talk a little bit about um, bedtime routines and some of the things that I've learned along the way. I was saying yesterday, Yesterday, that when we went in for our parent training at the beginning of time, uh, before we could start ABA, and we were asked to make our list of what is the challenging behavior that we most need to change, and I put at the top of the list, we have got to get our child to go to sleep. Uh, he was a he was two and a half at that point. And he could not go to sleep until he was exhausted. And the only way we could exhaust him was by driving him around the block for hours hours and playing Simon and Garfunkel and you know it was just I, I literally was so sleep deprived that I became worried of what was going to happen that I was going to crash the car or you know just because I would go to sleep um 
So one of the things that we were talked to about is what were we doing during the day? That sometimes, you know, that antecedent, and we talk about antecedents, um, and uh, I, that it's usually what happens right before. And when we get into talking about antecedents well before, uh, then usually we're talking about uh, motivating operations or establishing operations, just to give you the jargon. But think of it this way. How do we set ourselves up for success? Because we want to be successful. And our success is having a happy sleeping child so that we can get rest and so that we can have a life for 10 minutes before we get rest, right? Isn't that a goal that we all, all want and how are we setting ourselves up for success to make that happen and I don't know what you're doing but I'll tell you what I was doing and what I had to change my child was taking a nap and that was the first thing that had to go because some kids need a nap and then can go to sleep I am amazed by this my friends who have four-year-olds who take a nap for three hours in the afternoon and then they go to bed like clockwork at eight o'clock at night and I go how are you doing how do you make that happen I don't understand because that was so not my child. My child would take a nap and and it was always and we tried to stop the nap thing. Can I just tell you that like 4:30 in the afternoon and I'd have him running around and doing stuff and being really active. I could not go anywhere in the car in the afternoon because if it went after three o'clock, from three o'clock to six o'clock in the afternoon, if he was in a car instantaneously like I could be talking to him and doing whatever I could have somebody sit next with him and it, out out and there was nothing you could do about it and he would go to sleep for an hour and you could dangle him by his heels and tickle him put him in water it didn't matter he was out for at least an hour and then he could go for another 12 hours He'd be up till four o'clock in the morning going woohoo party pants um, so I had to change a lot of how I did my afternoon. He could not take a nap, which meant there was no driving anywhere from three to six. I had to change speech therapy to come to our house instead of us driving it to it because I would get there and he would be asleep in the car and they couldn't wake him up and we missed the speech appointment. So they came to us and we rearranged that, made other things in the morning. And it, from three to six, I kept him as busy as I could keep him uh, just run, 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 run. And then at six o'clock sharp. And by the way, this was very specific to my child, um, that, you know, cause I would know that then we were past the window of when he was tired. And by the way, it's the same period of time for me every day from three to six. I'm just a little like, Oh, I'm a little on the sleepy side. Right. Made it really hard for me cause I'm already sleep deprived. And now at my worst time, I need to keep this child active and moving. But at six o'clock, it was like every year changed in our house and we darkened windows and everything moved slower and everything moved more quiet and we would eat a nice quiet dinner and we would take a nice quiet bath and then we would show a nice video that was called uh, Sleepy Nights, I think. And I, you know, I, I was told to get this video and it was kind of expensive and I thought the first time we watched it, it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen because they show it's got happy upbeat music and it shows all these animals and the baby animals and they're going around the barnyard and they're doing all these things and then there's a part of the video where it shows that the sun has set and it's a cartoon representation of the sun setting and it's really long and boring I think and then they show all the animals they're just standing there and their eyes are getting heavier and they're going to sleep. And I remember sitting there on the couch with my son and he was riveted to this, like it was the most amazing thing he had ever seen. And, and I remember sitting there on the couch with him and turning to my husband and saying, this isn't going to work. This is the stupidest. And I went to sleep. <laughs> There's something about that video. I don't know what it is, uh, but it, and I have insomnia, and I, I'm telling you, there's something about that video. Um, see if you can find it used. Don't don't pay a fortune for it because it can be very expensive. But in any case, uh, you know, and so he is like incredibly, incredibly sleepy, and then we go into the ritual, right? And I had been trying to have a bedtime ritual and trying to do the reading and stuff, and what I learned from my 
uh, parent training was that the ritual <laughs> is great, but a whole bunch of stuff has to happen before it in order for the ritual to work. Um, and that really my bedtime plan starts at 9 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> You know, that everything that happens leads up to the moment where we crest into the ritual and that it's truly effective. Now, as kids get older and you say that your child is four, um, and depending on where the receptive language is, then you can start to work on things. And we've talked and we've had experts on the show talking about uh, bedtime rituals that come with a bedtime pass. We've had Evelyn Gould in particular talking about that, about, you know, having a certain number of passes that for each pass they can get up out of bed one time. Maybe there's a drink pass, maybe there's a bathroom pass, maybe there's an ask to mom, ask mom a question pass. And that there's three passes and when the three passes are done that it's time. I love that your child has the functional communication skills that they're saying just five more minutes. My question is what happens when they ask for five more minutes? Um, and I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know that there is a right answer, but what is the consequence? Because is the consequence in some way making it so that they never, ever have to go to sleep until they pride themselves to sleep? Don't feel that anybody is passing judgment because uh, I've shared that I still have issues with the bedtime ritual because I... I need to get really, really clear on this is, and when I put clear consequences um, and say, here's the reward you get for doing these things, uh, and I uphold it, that is the behavior I get. I just don't do it long enough. I keep thinking it's going to maintain itself, and it doesn't. And I'm just being lazy because I'm that tired at that time of night. Um, so. I understand and get it, but we'll bring somebody in either tomorrow or we'll definitely have um, Angela, excuse me, Persicky talking about this on Thursday. Um, but take a look at what are you doing before the ritual? Are you setting yourself up for success? I was not. You might be. Um, and there might be some other things going on there. But take a look at it and see what you have there. Okay, we're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, we have our cognition tip of the week. We're going to talk about white lies. So stick with us. And don't forget that at 11 o'clock, we're going to be joined by Michonne Reynolds. And we're going to talk about, I'm not going to spill the tea this time, uh, but reaching out of camera for a complete guide to teaching art to those with autism utilizing the elements and principles of design and life skills by Michonne Reynolds and Michonne's going to be joining us via Skype that's at 11 o'clock just in a few minutes so stick with us is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. 
choosing activities. It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And uh, we're talking right now about cognition. Uh, cognition, it's thinking, how we think about things. And one of the things that we teach when we're teaching cognition to individuals on the autism spectrum. I'm, I'm stopping saying kids because I don't want to further this idea that we can only teach it to kids. There's adults that we can teach these things to, including ourselves. Whether you're on the spectrum or not, if you want to build some skills in some different areas, you can using the principles of ABA. Uh, and one of the things that we do teach our individuals on the autism spectrum is how to tell a lie and how to detect when someone else is lying to you. And I think it's really interesting that whenever we teach things, we try to teach things from the point of view of yourself doing it and somebody else doing it because we're always trying to get that expressive and receptive, but also to show that there's two sides of everything, that perception of uh, taking perspective. Well, I'm looking at it from this side because I'm here and this person's looking at it from this side and they're there. We're both seeing the same thing, but we're seeing it from different angles. So I, I do love that um, that we teach things in that way and I know that a couple of people have said to me along the way well why would you teach lying because uh, there is one exception uh, to that rule of, of teaching things from both ways that we don't teach children on the autism spectrum there are no lessons and skills anyway to teach them how to be sarcastic because it's not a necessary skill to be sarcastic uh, in order to be successful in life right you know uh, <laughs> it's pleasure Sometimes I enjoy being sarcastic, um, but it isn't necessary to succeed. However, it is necessary to succeed to be able to detect sarcasm. sarcasm. So we teach children and adults on the autism spectrum how to detect sarcasm. Sarcasm. Uh, my son always says sarcastic. <laughs> Still, he has a hard time saying. I, I always say no. It's sarcastic, not sarcastic. Um, 
But in any way, in any case, uh, we do teach them how to detect sarcasm, but we don't have lessons in the skills program at this time. If somebody can make a really good case for why it needs to be taught, I guess they could add them, but I don't think it needs to be taught. And I don't know about your child, but my child generalized it. We never taught him how to be sarcastic. We taught him how to detect it, and now he generalized being sarcastic, which is okay. Um, but we're talking about white lies today. So why is it important for our children to be able to detect when somebody's lying to them? I think that is pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, it's going to help them to be able to negotiate friendships. It's going to help them to be able to be safe so that when that person is standing there in the parking lot and saying, get in the car because I'm taking you to your mom who's at the hospital, that they know, mm -mm, no, that would not be happening, right? We need those kinds of safety things built in. Um, but in life, you you know, just people taking advantage of them. They need to be able to begin to detect, are they going to get it 100%? No. And are we going to teach them that there's no way to be 100% when somebody's lying? Absolutely. But it is important for them to start to be able to realize, you know, and recognize the tells for people when they're not being honest. Um, likewise, it is important for us to teach them how to tell white lies. Uh, and we're calling it white lies because there's a certain amount of lying that um, we all need to do in life, right? Whether it's to be polite, uh, that's a good reason to lie, whether it's to lie to be safe, um, or it's a lie because a lie by omission uh, for self-preservation. There are good reasons to know how to lie, and there also is the whole thing of in society there are games that we play in which we must lie in order to succeed. Um, and our kids shouldn't be shortchanged from that, right? So we can utilize those games to begin to teach them how how to lie. There are lots of card games that we can do where from starting with go fish, but there is a card game and I can never think what um, <clears throat> the name of it is. I think it's Oh Spite, um, where it's kind of like goldfish, but you ask the person, do you have any fours? And they're allowed to say no when they do, because you have to call them on it and say, I think you're lying. And there's specific language. I can't remember what it is, but by the way, it's in the skills program. Um, and there was even videos of a child learning how to lie and that learning that some, when somebody can tell when you're lying, you're less likely to win the game. Um, really important for the child to begin to understand, because I do think it helps them to understand how to detect when somebody's lying once they've gone through the process themselves, right? Um, so to realize that they have to keep their face in a certain way so that they don't, they're not smiling with the cards that they got and, and going, no, I don't have any fours, right? That they're not giving it away. Um, We've had lots of people come on the show and talk about what brilliant actors uh, kids on the autism can, uh, spectrum can be because they're very imaginative and they learn in a way that allows them to take on other things that other people do. And sometimes in acting, you know, people have to say something that isn't true for them. Um, and we can take it on in that respect with kids and have them pretend to be someone else to see what that feels like. Um, uh, these are all lessons that will help them throughout their life. I've said before on the show, my background is theater. That's what I used to teach at college. And uh, th I was a, a college professor teaching uh, acting and theater. And, uh, you know, I, I always found it amazing. Parents would come and say, oh, well, you know, my it'd be parents weekend. And they'd say, well, you know, my kid wants to take all these acting classes. And I just don't think it's a good idea. And I really want to discourage this. Why they would come to the theater professor to say that I never could figure out, right? But the thing that I would always say, to them is, you know, the thing about life is that I know for sure that the things that they learn in an acting class, they will apply to everything that they do, whether they're in a board meeting 10 years from now, or they're talking to their child and reading them a book, or, you know, asking somebody out for a date, all of the things that we do in an acting class are going to help them with that. Um, I don't know if the same could be said of every other class that they're going to take on a college campus. Uh, and the parents would go, oh. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that there's a certain amount of truth to that. And 
I, I think the same thing for our kids, because a lot of the things that we teach them are things that are going to help them throughout their life. When we ask them to take on things and to notice what their body is doing and what they're communicating with their body and to notice what other people are communicating when they do this or they do that, really, really amazing long range effects that help them to negotiate uh, relationships, to be better academic scholars, to understand how they need to behave so that people will appreciate them and respect them. Uh, really is amazing. Long reaching effects. Okay, I've gone over. We need to take a break because when we come back, we're going to be joined by Michonne Reynolds, who is the author of this great big book full of information, A Complete Guide to Teaching Art to those with autism. So stick with us. We'll be back with Michonne after these messages. Well, today we're going to be talking about how to teach children to recognize other people's emotions. Why is that important to teach kids with autism spectrum disorders? Um, children with autism have difficulty recognizing other people's emotions and uh, we as people generally do, do things or don't do things based on how other people react. And so it's really important to teach our children how to recognize the emotions of others so that they know how to behave or not behave. And so it's really important, too, that um, they start to pick up on how other people feel because it will determine should they continue acting a certain way around children in a playgroup or should they, um, should they do things to make their parents happy or other family members happy. So it's very important that they become aware and recognize what different emotions look like. So how do we go about teaching it? So basically, we generally start with trying to recognize other people's emotions by doing it through a photograph or in a book or through pictures because that's something that's a lot more salient or easier to identify mm -hmm. than um, a person that might be right in front of me mm -hmm. because maybe there's a lot of distractions going on or that everybody's gonna express their emotions in a different way. But then you want to make sure that you're taking the time to go into real life, pointing it out, whether it's contrived, for example. So I say, hey, um, you two over there, I want one of you to be happy, and then I'm gonna ask the child to see if they can recognize mm -hmm. that emotion because maybe something else is going on that's also making them happy, like you handed them a present. Um, you wanna make sure then that you start fading away from the contrivedness of it so as it's actually occurring in real life because a lot of times our kids have difficulty generalizing and just because you teach it from a photo or I sit here and I say how do you feel doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to transfer the skill. It's one of the primary deficits of kids on the spectrum is generalization. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we're teaching it at different levels mm -hmm. because ultimately everything that we are teaching them, we want them to be able to use in everyday life. Yeah. So that eventually we even lead up to, hey, if somebody's on the playground being mean to you, how is that gonna make you feel? Mm -hmm. And they might say, well, it's gonna make me, it's gonna make me angry. Mm -hmm. Well, what can you do about that in that right. situation? And then also eventually teaching them this is what you can say or do in that situation. But again, rehearsing that just in having a conversation is not necessarily gonna mean that the child is gonna start exhibiting that skill. Right. So what I might do then is, for example, let's say we're going on the playground and I know that it is in the past been a time that the child might get mad at somebody because maybe a child on the playground um, often always wants a turn. Right. And so I might say to my ch the child before we go on the playground, hey, if someone takes the ball away from you, what might you say or do? And so then I'm kind of priming them or coaching them before the situation occurs. Mm -hmm. That's still a prompt, but it's a step towards generalizing the skill in everyday life. Right. But the goal then would it be eventually that I don't have to remind them of that before right. the situation occurs. Right. They will have the scenario occur to them and then immediately know the correct reaction or response that they need to give. Right. And, and I, I, can't, I, I can't say it enough, it builds on so many other things. Mm -hmm. Being able to recognize your own emotions, taking other people's perspectives, understanding where they're coming from, uh, so a really worthwhile thing to work on. Mm -hmm. And 
Absolutely, and especially too because it emerges so early. Yeah. But there, it continues develop for to develop for quite a long period of time too. Yeah. So um, yes, a lot of skills that build on from recognizing emotions of others and also your own emotions as well. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are going to be joined right now by Michonne Reynolds. I'm holding the book up. It's a complete guide to teaching art to those with autism. The subtitle is Utilizing the Elements and Principles of Design and Life Skills. So, Michonne, are you there with us? Yeah, hi, there good she is. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you? I'm hanging in. Yeah, great. Well, we're so thrilled to, ha thrilled to have you on here. And this is an amazing book that you've written. And I'm wondering, you know, tell us what inspired you to write this particular book? Well, as an art teacher of many, many years, I was asked to teach classes. Uh, I shared a classroom with some um, kids, but I had never taught whole classes of kids with autism. And then I had an opportunity to teach whole classes of kids. And um, I didn't, you know, I wanted to, to teach them on their level and figure out what it was that their needs were. And so what I did is um, after a very short period of time, it took a couple of weeks, but I figured out that they were very visual learners. And that to me was a revelation because if they're visual learners, then that means that many things can be filtered through the arts and many of their issues can be filtered through the arts. And you know, it's a student centered program. It's, 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 a, it's a program where, you know, some of their developmental issues like increased cognition, self-expression, um, increased imagination, abstract thinking, visual spatial discrepancies, fine motor skills, mm -hmm. um, could all be done through actual projects. And then if you take it to a further level, which is, you know, that also increases their self-esteem and, and then they like it, they like doing it. And, but you have to you have to figure out where they are on the art spectrum, which is I call it the art spectrum, which is different than the autism spectrum, um, which is which is basically a, a, a developmental program that was devised by a couple people. There are different types of learning, like you know, a guy called Lowenfeld figured out different types of learning, but there's schematic learning. So if you can figure out where they are, then it was like, okay, well, let's figure that out. And then if you take it to a further point, which if you start to have them talk about the art, which some are verbal, some are nonverbal, some are using their, their, um, their devices. Um, yeah. Devices. Yeah. Right. And, and, and they can, they can increase their social interaction. They can increase their communication. And then not only that, that gives people actually a, I, I don't know if, it, if you would call it a blueprint, but it's definitely um, a year to year to year looking at an increase in development, yeah. which, which goes along with their IEP, which can say, hey, look, here's where you were, here's where you are. And that made a difference to me. And then, you know, again, just to do the whole project itself, it, it requires life skills. It, it requires organizational abilities. It requires putting things away. It requires getting things out. It requires rules and regulations and painting is printmaking is different than using markers and mm -hmm. you know. But it is an interactive thing. So it, it 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 is. It's a huge thing that can help these people. And that really, to me, was the whole inspiration of writing the book, because to me, it was all about helping people. How do I help these people have a better quality of life overall over a long period of time, those that are already diagnosed? So that, that was my inspiration in writing the book. Well, that's great. And we should talk a little bit about your background because you, and you mentioned a little bit that you are somebody who has taught art for a number of years. And I taught art for 20, 23 years um, in different situations. I've, I've taught everything from the gifted and talented to, um, believe it or not, geriatrics to um, people who 
have had um, much more disabilities, um, Down syndrome, um, inclusion, um, a lot of different types of people and understanding arts, went to art school, um, you know, have a, have a degree, an undergraduate degree, and then went into the business world, did that for a while, owned an ad agency, and then decided to go back to school and decided to become an art teacher. And when I decided to become an art teacher, I wanted to be a great art teacher, yeah. not just someone who showed up and taught art, not someone who at 22 years old said, oh, I think I'm going to be an art teacher. I, you know, at six years old, I took my first oil painting class. Okay. Yeah. So to me, the arts have a longevity and they have a place in the system. They have, you know, roots all, all the way back to Aristotle and Plato. And, you know, there's a whole big part of the book that also talks about, look, if it looks works for all these other populations, these, these other populations that are high risk mm -hmm. and that can mean anything. Yeah. Okay. The, the chances are if these are visual learners, which they are, that it's a really good bet that it's going to happen, that this helps them. Yeah. And that's the purpose or the premise under which it was written. Yeah. And then when I worked with them, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And the kids thrived. Right. Okay, great. Well, and we should also mention, too, that you have been a master curriculum writer as well for the arts. Right. I've written curriculums for um, many, many different, um, well, on the East Coast of the United States, which is where I'm from. I'm, I'm an East Coast gal. Um, but, you know, for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, for Christina Public Schools in Delaware, Anne Arundel County Public Schools, which is in Maryland. Um, I worked in Florida. I, I've worked I extensively in the Philadelphia metropolitan yeah. area. And um, I've revamped entire programs that had no 3D, just 2D. I was like, well, why don't we have a 3D? People think in 3D and 2D. Right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know? So, so clearly, you're an expert in the field, and I, and I want to take a short break, but I want to come back and really delve into because this is quite an interesting book. It's not a small book, but even then, I'm amazed at what is contained in this book. In this book, because there's quite a bit for a teacher or for a parent who's interested in teaching art to their child on the autism spectrum. This is quite a resource. So we're going to take a break and come back and talk about the book uh, and crack the book open and talk about some things. So stick with us. I would love. My name's Matias and I'm eight years old. My brother's Christian and he's ten he has autism. What I like about Christian is his sense of humor. He makes me laugh a lot. The most fun I've been with Christian is when we go into the ocean and we play. When Christian and I are in, in the ocean, we, you can't really tell Christian has autism. Christian would like to swim across the ocean. It's hard for him to talk and when it does, it's like, it just comes out with, like, not right. He has the words locked inside of him. Sometimes people stare and it's a little uncomfortable. At night, there's always a loud sound of Christian crying in the other room. It's one of the times that's hard to have a brother with autism. I would like the world to actually find something that can help Christian with his autism. Visit AutismSpeaks.org. Welcome back to Autism Live. Our special guest right now is Michonne Reynolds. She is the author of A Complete Guide to Teaching Art to Those with Autism, subtitled Utilizing the Elements and Principles of Design and Life Skills. Before the break, Michonne was telling us about some of her experience and, and why she was inspired to write this book. And I said when we came back, I want to delve in and talk about, because Michonne, there's there's so much here in this book, and I just want to kind of read through the, the t there's a whole explanation of how to use the book. What I love about this is that it's a book for anybody wherever they are. If you're already an art teacher, this is going to be a great resource to helping you to work with somebody on the autism spectrum. But if you're a parent who's never taught art before, and you've got a child on the autism spectrum, and you want to start working on some art projects, this is a great book for you as well. And you can use the book in many different ways. But you start with part one, basic 
facts about ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, where you really go through some of the different diagnoses and some of the different things. Then uh, part two, schematic art development stages. Uh, step Part three is foundational in, uh, instructional elements. Part four, review of literature. Part five, successful art model programs. Part six, the elements and principles of design. Part seven, building an art cabinet, all the supplies that you need. We get to part eight, planning an art curriculum. Uh, part nine, individual developmental concerns, so specifying for an individual. Part 10, designing a curriculum. 11, effective tr st teaching strategies which that alone, you've got to get this online and make it available for everybody, Michonne. Uh, it is online. Okay. Part 12, behavior management techniques, because you're going to run into some behavior. Part 13, implementing a curriculum. 14, evaluation procedures, because that's going to be important. Part 15, instructor and parent, parental participation. 16, final thoughts and conclusion. And then we get to part 17, which is the lessons, which is the main part of the book. That's correct. <laughs> so it's pretty exhaustive and extensive, but some of those things that you were talking about, like Aristotle and those kinds of things, if somebody is interested in knowing what the background for something is, you've got that in the book and a whole bunch of other people of knowing well, yeah, why you should do. Go ahead. But that's great, but, but the bottom line is this, okay? The arts can really help these people, and that's the, the bottom line. And the thing is, what I did is write it so that if anyone didn't know anything about art, they could teach it to their kid yeah. Yeah. or teach it to their, you know, if you're a special ed teacher and you're not art trained, you could teach it. If you're a parent, don't know anything, and you 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 don't need it because I gave it to you in one step directions. I gave yeah. you all the lessons in one step directions. But not only did I do that, I gave you the life skill options. In other words, sometimes people are stud are trying to work on you know motor skills, or sometimes they're trying to work on communicative skills. So you get once you pick lessons and you pick how you want to do it, then you also pick and choose what is appropriate for the individual yeah. at hand. Yeah. And because no two kids are the same in this particular situation. Yep. I'm the first person to figure out a way to write it down. And one of the ways to write it down yeah. is that there are no ways to get mandates on these kids. Yeah. Each kid is individual. Yeah. And if you can give it to the people trying to teach them and they can pick and choose how to best educate the people that they're dealing with, then those are the best ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, but I love it that it's in the book. And even, I want to say how exhaustive, I don't know if you guys can see this, but even to the point where she's giving you forms that here we have an assessment rubric form. So that and yet, and it's exactly. full of things like that. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, and you've got notes for the special education teacher, uh, recommendations for the art teacher, suggestions for the homeschooled parent. I, it's just really, really amazing. But then we get into the, the bread and butter of the book, as far as I'm concerned, Michonne, um, because not everybody is going to use every single element of that first part of the book, but it's there Absolutely for you if you need it. But then you get into the lessons. And how many lessons do you include in this book? There are a hundred lessons, but I call it the book of what hundred lessons with a thousand combinations. Because yeah. there are a thousand combinations on how to use them because each one of those lessons has life skill options. Yep. And, it's and every life skill option is yeah. going to be different for every single solitary kid. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm, you pick and choose for the kids you're either whether it's a six person in your classroom or you're sitting across from your own kid or you're getting yeah. together with a group of parents that, you know, doing an, uh, an assessment, um, you know, where you're, you're talking about how to to, to talk about art, I like it. I like it because it's blue. I like it because it has shapes. Well, there's way more to it than that because there's core subjects involved in here. There's math, there's science, there's language art. There's all kinds of things. So yeah. it depends on the concentration that you choose. You could teach the same lesson three years in a row, four years in a row, and have a different concentration of a life skill. Yeah. That, so it makes it an invaluable resource of yeah. 100 lessons. 
Yeah, and and it's amazing as I'm flipping through the different lessons and, and, and there's so many good things here. What I love too is that you, you give the lesson and you give uh, either an example of the art or you give your know, stuff in the back and the appendices that gives you uh, as the parent or the teacher whoever you are the format um, and sometimes you know the beginning artwork if it's something where they're going to design or uh, decorate on top of you give them the actual thing so we don't have to already be artists ourselves to be able to teach it but uh, and of course you guys probably can't see but they first she lists elements then the principles then the supplies needed and then the direction I've had people comment on that they've said you know I had books for my kids that they didn't include all of them I said oh trust me all of them are included yeah 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 so. Uh, so so there's the elements the principles the supplies needed which is the first thing that I'm gonna go to as a parent then the directions which are step by step and then for every single lesson it has the life skills um, and then you choose yeah yeah, what you want to focus on, which is really kind of amazing, because Michelle. Because that's what the autism, every kid is different and they, yeah. and they need that. But yeah. also the parent needs to know if they can color within the lines and they yeah. can read, they can teach art. Yeah, I've had people tell me I cannot draw a stick figure. Trust me, I spent two years writing this, so you can. You can draw a stick figure. You can follow these directions. <laughs> it even says turn paper right, turn yeah. paper left. I mean, I mean you can do this. It's really lovely. I mean, here's one lesson 44, which is roller coaster ride. And I can tell you, this is one. If I was flipping through here, that my son would find really exciting to work on, and it gives you step-by-step -step examples and, uh, uh, and the directions and the life skills so that you can pick what element of this that you want to be working on with your child um, to make a roller coaster ride. Um, and uh, endless amounts of lessons to, so that you can go through and see, okay, what do I already have for supplies that I could do on a rainy day um, and what do I want to work on? It's really quite ingenious, Michonne. I have to hand it to you. So loving it. My backyard has a Tree, the example and we're, and you can see that we're starting to work on perspective with this if that's what you choose to work on for it but I just I'm really impressed Michonne I, I quite love it and especially for those of you who are homeschooling and you want to include art and you should include art this is going to be an invaluable book for you so Michonne let's talk about how do people get a copy of this book well, you can do it a lot of different ways, but the way that I would most recommend doing it is to go to my website, which is teachingartforautism.com, mm -hmm. which has just recently been revised and uh, reposted. I'm going to have some um, m new postings coming up where there will be free lessons if you cannot afford to buy the book. There is a reduced cost that that it's most... Um, cost-efficient way to buy the book at this time I mean you talk about the two lessons um, the two lessons that you're talking about uh, in itself um, will are part of the showcase postings that are going to come up um, and you know they are off and actually the roller coaster ride has a virtual reality component to it um, which is a suggestion in the book there are so many things involved with these types of kids. And when you get into art, people often, sometimes they have trouble with supplies, but there's lots of suggestions on how to alleviate that or how to make it not so scary. And, you know, and it's, again, it's, it, it, it's a, I have to tell you, most of the kids, I, I can't say all the kids, but I would say 99% of the kids that I have worked with that have done art have come out of it with their self-esteem being greater, yeah. their IEPs being more diagnosed where people can track how they are and what they're doing, um, whether they're at home school they get together with other people um you know they can do that in a library or even an art um su supply store and do some social interaction so the things that are there not not their greatest assets the things that need to be improved on on assets are all within the fine arts the fine arts are a place where 
people don't realize because many times in this country we, we look at them as, as a fluff and they are not a fluff, particularly in this situation because these kids are predominantly visual learners. Yeah. So if that and if that's the case, yes, we're giving them iPads and yes, we're giving them iPods, but that doesn't teach them how to cut, doesn't teach them motor skills. There are lots of things that they're not getting from those. So the, to use the visual arts is only an asset to them. So the book was derived and devised and designed so that anybody could teach it because people were afraid of it or yeah. didn't. So, you know, I can't draw. I can't draw a stick figure. Well, yes, you can. You can do amazing things. Yeah, especially with the instructions that you've given you, given us here. And you know, you mentioned during the break when our audience didn't get a chance that it took you two years to put this together. And I can see the work that went into this. Uh, even I just want to bring up this one: Lesson 81, Monthly Fun Days Calendar Placemats. Um, and Michonne has gone to the trouble to give us suggestions about things for pretty much every week of the year um, to, uh, to, well, and through January, she gives you suggestions of all the things that you could do just in January. So well, that that's done for you. they can or they can take photographs, or they can Yeah, do stuff, it's amazing. they can write it down, or they can whatever. It's so absolutely they, amazing. Again, student center. It's, uh, there's just so many lessons in here you would never run out of things to work on. And again, I mentioned too that in the appendix, uh, if I can flip to the appendix here, it gives you all of the shapes that you can copy and be able to have for each one of the, the lessons. You have a copy machine. You can do what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a scanner. If you have a staples near you, you do pretty yeah. much good. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Or, or, your, your, or your computer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's truly amazing what's in here. So, um, you know, who do you envision using this book, Michonne? To be honest with you, I wrote it with with a variety of people in mind, okay? I, I was very, very much offended by the fact that when everyone said, oh, it's just art education. No, this is not just art education mm -hmm. for these people. This is not. This is not. The, these people are visually centered, which means things need to be filtered through these people. Yeah. But visually, okay, which means the special education teacher, okay, they take 40 minutes out of their day, 10 minutes to set it up, 10 minutes to shut it down, 20 minutes to work on it, okay, and give or take if in a couple minutes in between. The kids love it. The kids, sometimes they like the paint, sometimes they don't like the paint, sometimes they like the clay, sometimes they don't like the clay. Sometimes they're sensitive to things. Okay, so you give them gloves. There's 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 whole suggestions in the book yeah. about how you counteract that as well. Right. And, and and there's 20 types of crayons. You know, there's a whole chapter of how many crayons do you think there are? People think there are two. No, they're not. How many markers do you think there are? Well, guess what? There's about 35 types of markers now. Right, right. You know, so Some of them it's, smell. It's all about envisioning how they can use this to better to, yeah. to, to help their quality of life to yeah. become part of to become part of of, of understanding things better because a lot of them are isolated and they don't understand um Sometimes I've, I've had kids draw a whole map of a subway map after looking at it once. I've had another kid take four mediums and put it all together and he can't read. I've had other kids who can't speak that have done these miraculous things in art. So mm -hmm. the point is, it, it gives them another opportunity. Yeah. It gives them another. It gives them another place on the map to use either in conjunction with or in addition to something that already is, if not art-centered education, which is a tough song. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I can see that there are so many different uses for this. I, you know, if you're homeschooling, I think it's essential. I think if you are a parent of a child who's going to school, and the teacher, as is a lot in this, uh, in, especially in the elementary grades in this economy, is a lot of times the person who is doing the art give this as a gift to them. Um, if you're a parent and you like to do things and have activities with your child and you know that your child has some interest or you have some interest in art, this is an absolute essential for you. But I think, and you know, give it to your school. Don't, 
It is not a kinesthetic activity. It is not about sit your kid down at the dinner table and give them a crayon and yeah. let them color for 20 minutes. That's right. a kinesthetic activity. That is not what we are talking about here. Right. What we are talking about here is an engagement, an mm -hmm. active engagement activity that enables them to thrive. Absolutely. And so you've had the opportunity to work with a wide range of people on the autism spectrum and use art. And what are some of the amazing things that you've seen as a result? Uh, you, you've mentioned that you've seen people who didn't have verbal skills be able to put four mediums together. And, and do you see them um, gaining these life skills in, in your classroom? I actually do. I do. I, I see it if, if they, if, if, in that particular case, if the teachers use that to put it in his IEP or something, I could actually see him working, and this may sound silly to some people, but in a gallery or being a very sweet, very nice kid that, you know, is coming on to 17, 18 year old, I could see him doing that. I see people that have gone to group homes that have done well. I see, see some other people that are just coming up with some amazing things that are even younger that, you know, just, just are unbelievable. Yeah. But the arts also help their confidence. There's a, there is legitimate factor in that. There is something that they can see. They can see something they did. Yeah. They, they, oh, wow. So now you have a visual record. Right. Okay. This is not something that is required in the individual education program, although I do believe that it should be. But when you look at it from year to year, if you look at where the kid came from, what the kid can do, and what the kid can do now, wow. And the kid can see it because they remember everything, most of them. I mean, they remember things. It's just amazing yeah. how much they remember. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're like, wow, really? You made that win? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> It, it, it is amazing, and I and I want to say we talk a lot on this show about when something is reinforcing for our kids, and when something is reinforcing, then it it creates an environment in which they're going to leap over things that have been obstacles for them, and and what I love about your book is that it helps us to make art one of those reinforcing things, and makes it possible for the person who's delivering it to make it something that's reinforcing to them and reinforcing to the child, and when we do that, we will see progress in a lot of different areas. Uh, Michonne, this is absolutely wonderful. I'm going to ask you once again to tell your website, and we'll put it up on the screen so people can find the book. Book. Tell us again. And what I it would is. ask you one thing too. There oh yeah, is, absolutely. Uh, there is a option on the web page now mm -hmm. that you can become part of uh, a community where, if you want my help to start to do a program, or if you would like to track a program, or uh, even from an individual or from uh, you know a class, mm -hmm. that we would do that, and then we would go ahead and we're going to put up a gallery page. Lovely. And we're going to do um, some things that so the kids can have some more recognition, and then they can look at it in in a different way too, and also the parents can as well, so that we can look at it as a, as an ongoing complementary continual program because awesome. that's what this is about this awesome. is about continuing to make it better okay great so uh we put your website up again but let's do it one more time emily and michonne tell us what your website is it's called teachingartforautism.com okay. and there is a preview if you go on the preview page there's a lesson if you go on the contact us page there is a space where you can tell us about the people that you're teaching whether it be your individual person or some class and i will try to help you in any way that i can so that we can figure out um, how to make it on a long going basis okay. to actually have them have a better quality of life. And that's what the whole thing was written about in the first place. Well, that's great, Michonne. We thank you so much for your time and for your work. And we hope that people take advantage of that. And we'll check back with you in the coming months to see how that project's going. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Michonne. We'll talk to you soon. All righty. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.
So that was Michonne Reynolds, a really amazing book. I want to encourage you to check out her website to see what it's all about. But just simply, I mean, it's a wealth of information about dealing with different issues. But if, if for no other reason, those 100 lessons with the life skills built in is a reason to own this book or to gift it to someone in your school or someone in your family, anybody, I think anybody who has uh, an individual that they're working with on the autism is autism spectrum, but honestly, anybody who is interested in teaching art, it's really well put together. Okay, we're going to take a break and come back and uh, maybe take on a little bit of this controversy that's happening on Facebook. So stick with us. Today has partnered with Cox Communications to bring Inclusion Films to San Diego. Led by Joey Travolta, Inclusion Films teaches filmmaking to developmentally disabled children. It's a practical film camp where we take uh, them through the process of making a film. And each group, we split them into three groups, and they're each responsible for making a short film together as a group. This is a wonderful opportunity for children to build their self-confidence, to develop new friendships, and it's also an opportunity for their siblings to come and to enjoy the company of other peers in this really wonderful, fun setting. Okay, so you know what time it is? One more time! Yeah! 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 yeah. Woo! Cox Communications has years of uh, supporting the community. We believe in giving back to the communities we serve, and military, youth, and education are our three pillars. And so this really matched up with everything that we're about and what we're trying to do to give back to the San Diego community. And so we were thrilled to meet up with ACT Today and Inclusion Films and to have this wonderful synergy. Three organizations really trying to move towards a common cause. Oh, are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay, you'll be talking to me, okay? So tell me your name, say my name is. In the past, we've done The Junior Apprentice, which was a takeoff on The Apprentice, uh, The Really, Really, Really Late Show, which is a takeoff on The Tonight Show, and this year we're doing a combination of 60 Minutes and uh, Entertainment Tonight called 30 Minutes Tonight. Okay, good. So now you understand what an improv is. You guys get the idea what an improv is? Yeah. To go with the flow of something, especially in the action. My son Elijah, he's into movies and he's into music. And so this program might bring out his particular skills. Amazing. You're like a professional animal. Every single person here we've met has been so kind, loving, and caring. They've given Nicholas the opportunity to be himself and be around people who have the same passion and interest as he does. What is it you learned from him? What did you learn from him? Uh, it was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. And when they collaborate, they come up with a product that everybody can see they're a part of something. They become a community, they become a family. When you make a film, you really become a family. Are we heading to the film camp? Yay! Yeah. Yeah. We are close to Hollywood. Yeah. And Hollywood is always looking for young people. Autism is an epidemic, and it's not gonna get any better anytime soon. Families are struggling to pay the bills, to put food on their table, let alone provide services for their children. And ACT Today is a vehicle of support for these families by helping them get access to life supports that they couldn't otherwise have. My experience in film camp has been great and I just really love how I mean, all you guys decided to bring us together. What I learned here, I learned to animate. 
how to operate the plot board. I learned about the animation and filming uh, and making friends. Making new friends and acting. Meeting new friends. You can be anything you want to be. Welcome back. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we had somebody write in, and I thought it was Michonne, and but it's not Michonne, so now I don't know who it is. Uh, somebody said, if you're, because we were talking about Indiana and the services in Indiana, and somebody wrote in and said, if you're looking for a communication device camp in October at Indiana University, is they have an awesome. Uh, an awesome, awesome camp for children with communication devices between the ages of, uh, excuse me, five and 25. And the the reason why I thought it was Michonne was that the next comment was, I can tell everybody about this camp and AVA camp when I'm on. So I thought it was Michonne writing in, but it's obviously one of our guests because we have a bunch of people that we've been lining up. Uh, and I know one person in particular that we um, have said that we would love to have come on the show that uh, specifically wants to talk about using a communication device in they use a communication device, so it might be that person. But in any case, uh, love to know that they're in October at Indiana University. Uh, if you have someone who's using a device to help communicate, there is an awesome, awesome camp. Uh, so great to know. I'm having trouble getting on Facebook, which might just be the universe saying stay out of it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but in any case, uh, I wanted to take a second to talk about a couple of the things that are coming up uh, towards the end of this week. Uh, we, well, tomorrow we have uh, going to be joining with us during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, the wonderful and fabulous Nancy Allspa Jackson. And she is the executive director of Autism Care and Treatment Today. We're going to be taking on a bunch of different things tomorrow. We're going to be talking about a dad who has a fundraiser that's going on right now because he wants to be able to give money to put iPads in children's hands who need them. So talk about the communication device. Uh, so that's a really exciting thing. I don't know if the dad's going to actually be able to join us on the air, but we're going to be talking about it. And I know that tomorrow we're going to be joined by Misty Mackey for a short period of time. We've had Misty on the show before. She is an expert in aut autism insurance contracts and and this transition, you know, because every day we're finding out new information. And in particular, in the state of California, we're in the middle of that really interesting, right? <laughs> uh, really interesting being a euphemism for a very bumpy transition time, uh, where we've gone from being a regional center based system to now we're going to be insurance with regional center helping out. Um, and it's all going to be good when we get it all figured out. But recently this week, a, um, a flyer was put out widespread, uh, announcing that there are new laws and that if you have insurance in the state of California, California that covers hospitalization and medical bills, then you now have autism insurance reform. And I know a lot of us, myself included, looked at that and went, what? Something new happened? Um, we have to get an insurance expert in here to talk about that. Well, nothing new has happened. Uh, in, in reality, there, uh, there are things about that uh, bulletin that went out. It was consumer awareness alert that are uh, absolutely accurate. But for those of us who do not know insurance parlance, we will be confused. I know I was certainly confused. So we're going to have Misty Mac in tomorrow to shed some light on that and save us all from being frustrated. We're going to get educated. That's what we need to do. It's rough. I didn't want to learn one more thing, but apparently I got to know about insurance. Okay, I will do that. Uh, as will the rest of us, because it's going to make a big difference to your children and how you move forward and how you make choices, because uh, that's really what it all comes down to. So that's going to be tomorrow at 11 o'clock during that 11 o'clock hour with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And by the way, we are also going to be talking about the uh, golf tournament that will be happening on Monday, August 27th, uh, that benefits uh, the military initiative part of Let's Talk Autism, or excuse me, uh, the military initiative of ACT Today, not Let's Talk Autism, Shannon and Nancy. I'm so confused. I'm excited about it, though. Because, you know, ACT Today uh, is an organization that gives grants to families for the kinds of things that they need 
in their lives. And that and anyone can apply for a grant. All you have to do is visit www.act-today.org. And they have grant phases. They are not currently in a grant phase. And I always, when they are in a grant phase, I will remind you on a daily basis. So stay tuned to the show and I'll let you know when they're in their next grant phase. But you can go and look at the kinds of things that they have been able to do on ACT Today. But they have several different divisions of ACT Today. Um, and one of them is their military initiative because you know the, uh, the prevalence of autism is even higher in our military families. And unfortunately, and it pains me to say this, uh, that while the prevalence is higher and we don't know yet know why, the services that are typically given to our military families are less than what is given to everybody else. I, that just, I, 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 it leaves me absolutely speechless. How are military families, they can have a member that's being put in harm's way or has retired from having been in harm's way and that their child does not get even equal to what the rest of us are, uh, are getting for our children is just amazing to me. So ACT Today has a special division that is just for helping and supporting military families which I have to applaud. By the way, they also have uh, Act Espanol and a couple of other different areas. They have a safety program where they help specifically with issues like elopement, things like fences and ABA to help children who wander or bolt. Um, so lots of different divisions of Act today. Um, something really for everyone, I feel. And they have this golf tournament every year and it is specifically a fundraiser for that military initiative and it is a star-studded event and we're very much looking forward to we won't be doing a live show on that day we tried to do that last year and it's really a little too hectic uh, but we are going to be on the site on that day and getting interviews some of the people that will be there of course it's hosted by the lovely Joe Montaigne uh, who has a daughter who is on the autism spectrum and a host of friends of his I know that uh, we're going to be joined by D.B. Sweeney I'm very excited about that. Kevin Sorbo and uh, Jason Gedrick, who was there last year, will also be there this year, and many, many other stars. So we'll be interviewing them on Monday to share those interviews with you in the coming weeks. Uh, and the heart of it, though, is to raise money. If you still want to golf and you're in the Los Angeles area or will be in the Los Angeles area on Monday, you can still golf. And it's not that expensive. You can go to Act Today and sign up to golf. So that is on Monday, and we're going to have some pictures from last year's event, uh, and Nancy will be telling us more about what the expectation for that is. Uh, and then, of course, we'll be back on Tuesday talking about the kinds of things and share the interviews as they are edited. Uh, so Wednesday, we're going to be talking about all of those different things, and then we unfortunately are not joined by Evelyn Gould on Wednesday. Normally, she's here with us, but she is out of town this week and won't be here with us. Um, but but on Thursday, we will be joined by the fabulous Angela Persicky, who is from our research department, and she's going to be sharing some interesting things, and I'm going to specifically ask her to talk to us about research about bedtime rituals. So we'll definitely be talking about that. And of course, on Friday, on Friday, we've got some really exciting things coming up. Eric Peacock from My Autism Team is going to be joining us at 1020 in the morning. That'll be a really exciting interview, and then at 11 o'clock o'clock, we'll have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, who is the head of research and development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and is also um, the director of the Autism Research Group. So that will be very exciting on Friday. So that's what's coming up. We're really looking forward to that. We're going to take a short break and come back to finish out the show. Stick with us. C15. This week uh, actually started probably about a year and a half ago, and Rocky and I were, uh, Rocky Rayner and I were talking about a way that we could use the expertise that Jack has, combining it with the surf team here in Half Moon Bay. So this week has really been quite a collaboration between the surf team, Indojack Surf Charities, Square Pegs, and then the Horseboy Foundation. And 
being able to bring it all together in one place and try something new of combining the horse riding with the surfing uh, has just been an incredible experience for all the people involved. We are in Half Moon Bay, California, and we're um, putting on a surf, a charity surf camp in conjunction with the Half Moon Bay Surf Club, with the Square Peg Foundation and the Horse Boy, um, putting together kind of a, a, a new program uh, using horses and surfing to connect with special needs kids, um, namely autism. And so Indo Jack Surf Charities came out here to sort of run uh, the surf portion of the program and to train the Half Moon Bay Surf Club to do this in the future on their own. To see uh, the autistic program come here to Half Moon Bay and to get these kids in the water and to get the surf club involved was just an amazing vibe at the beach. I was so surprised we were able to get them all into wetsuits. That was just amazing because that was the thing I thought we were going to have the most difficulty with. And then when they got in the wetsuits and they got on the water, it was easy. They just all wanted to surf. So I'm Rupert Isaacson. I'm the founder and uh, director of the Horse Boy Foundation. And um, I work with autistic people and horses. Um, we're doing our first uh, horse and surf camp um, today, uh, over the next couple of days. And I, this is the first time I've ever gone surfing in my life. But I can really see why um, People have been uh, using surfing as a therapy for autism. It's very, very, very similar to the effects of the horse. You've got this giant movement underneath you. You've got the magic of the living thing, either the horse or the ocean. You've got the sense of adventure. You have um, to get over a certain slight fear and discomfort, which then, of course, boosts your self-confidence. And I've been watching kids out there today who are struggling um, verbally, who are struggling sensorily. I can see that all the sensory stuff calms down because the movement of the ocean is very similar to the horse. And I've been seeing kids that are barely verbal, using complex language, um, really their intellect really coming to the fore and all that, that uh, white noise in the head and all that physical discomfort that a lot of them go through neurologically is being calmed down by the ocean in a very similar way the way you find it with the horse. I totally, totally see the benefits for kids. Um, I'm an autism dad. My son had an amazing experience out there. He even had a wipeout and had a bad reaction, had to get over it and, um, and find his courage again and go out. And he did and he feels fantastic about it. The autistic kids, you know, you think they can't do anything, but they were having lots, loads of fun. Using surfing on the surface with kids with physical and mental challenges might seem a little um, a little lightweight. You know, people might question, well, what are you doing? Uh, you're not curing anything, you're not fixing anything, but what I've learned and what you'll all learn as you view this is that there's an element of surfing that helps a child realize that getting knocked down, they can get back up. There's one email that came in this week the day after we finished and it was this was the best day of his life and if that was all we gave them to give one child the best day of their life that's worth it
Welcome back to Autism Live and uh, incredible program that you just saw an advertisement for that we uh, had a couple of the people here on the show to interview them and uh, it just sounded truly, truly amazing. I think any time we can get our children you know the key the key is the reinforcement if when something is reinforcing enough our kids overcome they do and i think that that's heartening for a lot of different reasons because it shows us that they can it does mean that there's some more work to break through but i think we're willing to do it right um and and it's a breakthrough for them and it's a breakthrough for us to see what they're capable of uh now your life may not be set up so that you can take your child on a horseback on a regular basis and your life may not be set up so that you can take them on a surfboard on a regular basis but i do think that uh, when you have the opportunity to do some amazing things with your, your child, it is amazing what you get back from it. Uh, I mentioned that we years ago, uh, there's another surfing program, Surfers Healing, which we should have them on the show sometime uh, because they were very good to us. And uh, my son got to go surfing with them. He had just turned five and didn't, didn't have great swim skills. And I thought it was going to be the end of me because he literally literally go down to the beach and there's a lot of standing around waiting and then they put your, your child in the wetsuit and they put them in the thing and then two complete strangers who don't even acknowledge you walk your child into the ocean and and you're like yay he's what did I just do what <laughs> why am I saying yay two strangers walk my child into the ocean with a surfboard and I don't even know what their names are and I don't have their driver's license how did that just happen and yet it's the most amazing um, miraculous and uh, my child came off the surfboard with just the biggest grin cold you know really really cold but the biggest grin on his face and he said mommy I not die one of the first big sentences uh, he said the sharks not get me mommy I not die uh, it was really amazing really really amazing and something that he talks about to this day we haven't been able to get him back on a surfboard but you know uh, I think he's just about at the point where he would go back on the surfboard and I'm just about at the point where I would let him but I think I would know the names of the people before I let them carry him away this time uh, in any case uh, a really exciting thing and uh, we were talking about art earlier when we have these other ways for our children to see the world um, that are really reinforcing to them sometimes. It, it is something that we can add to our child's repertoire and they will sometimes have amazing moments of breakthrough, either, either for us or for them, where they realize what they can do. It's very exciting. Okay, as this show ends, the conversation continues, thank goodness. You guys have lots of ways of getting in touch with us. I'm gonna ask Emily to cycle through some of those different ways right now. Email us, phone us, Skype us, Facebook us, tweet us, uh, whatever flips your switch. And don't forget that there are lots of different ways that you can be watching us. We continue to air on Autism Live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you turn it on, you're going to see something. You're either going to see a live show or a show that has been recorded in our recent past. Um, but if there's a specific show that you want to look for, you want to look for those on Blip TV, YouTube, iTunes or on Ustream and you can search for those specific topics, go ahead and look for toileting, look for bedtime uh, rituals, look for challenging behavior, what, look for biting. We've done shows on a lot of different topics, but we want to hear from you what you want to hear more about. So please partake in the conversation. Be a voice in our ear. Let us know what you need because that's what we're here for is for you. I want you to know as a parent on this journey how important it is for me to let you know you're not in this alone. There are so many people out there who are going through some semblance of what you're going through. It's not the exact same thing, right? And we all know that. Your circumstances are unique to you because your family is unique, your child is unique, your issues are unique, your financial constraints are unique. But to some extent, we all get some part of that uh, experience and we're here for you. 
And uh, I know that you're there for others too. And as you learn things that you're ready to share, we're here to give you that opportunity as well. So be a part of the show and in whatever way suits you, whether you're watching or participating or sharing, whatever it is, we appreciate the time that you spend with us. We're really looking forward to tomorrow. I think you're going to find, uh, especially Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, very exciting and informative. Uh, lots going on. But uh, until tomorrow, give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye.